Chapter 1 of The Martyrs of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Martyrs of Science by David Brewster. Life of Galileo. Chapter 1 Peculiar interest attached to his life, his birth, his early studies, his passion for mathematics, his work on the hydrostatic balance, appointed lecturer on mathematics at Pisa, his antipathy to the philosophy of Aristotle, his contentions with Aristotelians, chosen professor at mathematics in Padua, adopts the Copernican system, but still teaches the Ptolemaic doctrine, his alarming illness, he observes the new star in 1604, his magnetical experiments. The history of the life and the labours of Galileo is pregnant with the peculiar interest to the general reader, as well as to the philosopher. His brilliant discoveries, the man of science regards as his peculiar property, the means by which they are made, and the development of his intellectual character, belong to the logician and to the philosopher. But the triumphs and the reverses of his eventful life must be claimed for our common nature, as a source of more than ordinary instruction. The length and career with providence assigned to Galileo was filled up throughout his rugged outline with events even of dramatic interest. But though it was emblazoned with achievements of transcendent magnitude, yet his noblest discoveries were the derision of his contemporaries, and were even denounced as crimes which merited the vengeance of the heaven. Though he was the idol of his friends and the favoured companion of princes, Yet he afterwards became the victim of persecution, and spent some of his last hours within the walls of a prison. And though the Almighty granted him, as it were, a new sight to discreet unknown worlds in the obscurity of space, yet the eyes which were allowed to witness such wonders were themselves doomed to be closed in darkness. Such were the lights and shadows in which the history delineates. The starry Galileo with his woes but however powerful be their contrasts, they are not unusual in their proportions. The balance which has been struck between his days of good and evil is that which regulates the lot of men, whether we study it in the despotic sway of the autocrat, in the peaceful enquiries of the philosopher, or the humbler toils of ordinary life. Galileo Galilei was born at Pisa on the 15th of February, 1564 and was the eldest of the family of three sons and three daughters. Under the name Bonaiuti, his noble ancestors had filled the high offices at Florence, but about the middle of the 14th century, he seemed to have abandoned this surname for that of Galileo. Vincenzo Galilei, our author's father, was himself a philosopher of no mean powers, and though his talent seemed to have been exercised only in the composition of treatises on the theory and practice of music, Yet he appears to have anticipated even his son in a just estimate of the philosophy of the age and in a distinct perception of the true method of investigating truth. The early years of Galileo were, like those of almost all great experimental philosophers, spent in the construction of instruments and pieces of machinery, which were calculated chiefly to amuse himself and his schoolfellows. This employment of his hands, however, did not interfere with his regular studies, and though from the straitened circumstances of his father he was educated under considerable disadvantages yet he acquired the elements of classical literature and was initiated into all the learnings of the times music drawing and painting were the occupations of his leisure hours and such was his proficiency in these arts that he was reckoned a skilful performer on several musical instruments especially the lute and his knowledge of pictures was held in a great esteem by some of the best artists of his day. Galileo seems to have been desirous of following the profession of a painter, but his father had observed decided indications of early genius, and though by no means able to afford it, he resolved to send him to the university to pursue the study of medicine. He accordingly enrolled himself as a scholar in arts at the University of Pisa on the 5th of November, 1581, and pursued his medical studies under the celebrated botanist Andrew Casalipinus, who filled the chair of medicine from 1567 to 1592. 
in order to study the principles of music and drawing galileo found it necessary to acquire some knowledge of geometry his father seems to have foreseen the consequences of following this new pursuit and though he did not prohibit him from reading the euclid under ostilo rishi one of the professors at pisa yet he watched his progress with utmost jealousy and had resolved that it should not interfere with his medical studies the demonstrations however of the greek mathematician had too many charms for the ardent mind of galileo his whole attention was engrossed in the new truths which burst upon his understanding and after many fruitless attempts to check his ardour and direct his thoughts to professional objects his father was obliged to surrender his paternal control and allow the fullest scope to the genius of his son from the elementary works of geometry galileo passed to the writings of archimedes and while he was studying the hydrostatical treatise of the syracusan philosopher he wrote his essay on the hydrostatical balance in which he describes the construction of the instrument and the method by which archimedes detected the fraud committed by the jeweller in the composition of hiero's crown the work gained for its author the esteem of guido ubaldi who had distinguished himself by his mechanical and mathematical acquirements and who engaged his young friend to investigate the subject of the centre of gravity in solid bodies the treatise on this subject which galileo presented to his patron proved the source of his future success in life though the cardinal del monte the brother-in-law of ubaldi the reigning duke of tuscany ferdinand de medici was made acquainted with the merits of our young philosopher and in fifteen eighty nine he was appointed lecturer on mathematics at pisa as the salary however attached to this office was only sixty crowns he was compelled to enlarge this inadequate income by additional occupations of private teaching and thus to enroach upon the leisure which he was anxious to devote to science with his moderate competency galileo commenced his philosophical career at the early age of eighteen when he had entered the university his innate antipathy to aristotelian philosophy began to display itself this feeling was strengthened by the earliest enquiries and upon his establishment at pisa he seems to have regarded the doctrines of aristotle as the intellectual prey which in his chase of glory he was destined to pursue nizzoli who flourished near the beginning of the sixteenth century and giordano bruno who was burned at rome in sixteen hundred led the way in this daring pursuit but it was reserved for galileo to track the tarsian boar through its native thickets and at risk of his own life to strangle it in its den with the resolution of submitting every opinion to test of experiment galileo's first inquiries at pisa were directed to the mechanical doctrines of aristotle their incorrectness and absurdity soon became apparent and with a zeal perhaps bordering on indiscretion he denounced them to his pupils with an ardour of manner and of expression proportioned to his own conviction of the truth the deduction of the long established errors is apt to inspire the young philosopher with an exaltation which reason condemns the feeling of triumph is apt to clothe itself in the language of asperity and the abettor of erroneous opinions is treated as a species of enemy to science like the soldier who fleshes his first spear in a battle the philosopher is apt to leave the stain of cruelty on his early achievements it is only from age and experience indeed that we can expect the discretion of valour whether it is called forth in controversy or in battle galileo seems to have waged his stern warfare against the followers of aristotle and such was the exasperation which was excited by his reiterated and successful attacks that he was assailed during the rest of his life with the degree of rancour which seldom originates in a mere difference of opinion forgetting that all knowledge is progressive and that the errors of one generation call forth the comments and are replaced by the discoveries of the next galileo did not anticipate that his own speculations and incompleted labours might one day provoke unmitigated censure and he therefore failed in making allowance for the prejudices and ignorances of his opponents he who enjoys the proud lot of taking a position in the advance of his age need not wonder that his less gifted contemporaries are left behind men are not necessarily obstinate because they cleave to deeply rooted and venerable errors nor are they absolutely dull when they are long in understanding and slow in embracing newly discovered truths it was one of the axioms of aristotelian mechanics that the heavier of two falling bodies should reach the ground sooner than the other and that their velocity should be proportional to their weights 
galileo attacked the arguments by which this opinion was supported and when he found his reasoning ineffectual he appealed to the direct experiment he maintained that all bodies should fall through the same height in the same time if they are not unequally retarded by the resistance of the air and though he performed the experiment with the most satisfactory results by letting the heavy bodies fall from the leaning tower of pisa yet the aristotelians who with their own eyes saw the unequal weight strike the ground at the same instant ascribed the effect to some unknown cause and preferred the decision of their master to that of the nature herself galileo could not brook his opposition to his discoveries nor could the aristotelians tolerate the rebukes of their young instructor the two parties were consequently marshalled in a hostile array when fortunately for both an event occurred which placed them beyond the reach of danger don giovanni de medici a natural son of cosmo had proposed a method of clearing out the harbour of leghorn galileo whose opinion was requested gave such an unfavourable report upon it that the disappointed inventor directed against him all the force of his malice it was an easy task to concentrate the malignity of his enemies at pisa and so effectually was this accomplished that galileo resolved to accept another professorship to which he had been previously invited the chair of mathematics in the university of padua having been vacant for five years the republic of venice had resolved to fill it up and on the recommendation of guido ubaldi galileo was appointed to it in fifteen ninety two for a period of six years previous to this event galileo had lost his father who died in fifteen ninety one at an advanced stage as he was the eldest son the support of the family naturally devolved upon him and the sacred obligation must have increased his anxiety to better his circumstances and therefore added to his other inducements to quit pisa in september fifteen ninety two he removed to padua where he had a salary of only one hundred and eighty florins and where he was again obliged to add to his income by the labours of tuition notwithstanding this fruitful occupation of his time he appears to have found leisure of composing several of his works and completing various inventions which will be afterwards described his manuscripts were circulated privately among his friends and pupils but some of them strayed beyond the sacred limit and found their way into hands of persons who did not scruple to claim and publish as their own the discoveries and inventions which they contained it is not easy to ascertain the exact time when galileo became a convert to the doctrines of copernicus or the particular circumstance under which he had led to adopt them it is stated by gerard force that a public lecture at mostelin the instructor of kepler was the means of making galileo acquainted with the true system of the universe this assertion however is by no means probable and it was been ably shown by the latest biographer of galileo that in his dialogues of the copernican system our author gives the true account of his own conversion the passage is so interesting that we shall give it entire i cannot omit this opportunity of relating to you what happened to myself at the time when this opinion the copernican system began to be discussed i was then a very young man and had scarcely finished my courses of philosophy which other occupations obliged me to leave off when there arrived in this country from rostock a foreigner whose name i believe was christian forsitius a follower of copernicus this person delivered on this subject two or three lectures in a certain academy and to a crowded audience believing that several were attracted more of the novelty of the subject than by any other cause and being firmly persuaded that this opinion was a piece of solemn folly i was unwilling to be present upon interrogating however some of those who were there i found that they all made it a subject of merriment with the exception of one who assured me that it was not a thing wholly ridiculous as i considered this individual to be both prudent and circumspect i repented that i had not attended the lectures and whenever i meet any of the followers of copernicus i began to inquire if they had always been of the same opinion i found that there was not one of them who did not declare that he had long maintained the very opposite opinions and had not gone over to the new doctrine till he was driven by the force of argument i next examined them one by one to see if they were the masters of the arguments on the opposite side and such was the readiness of their answers that i was satisfied they had not taken up this opinion from the ignorance or vanity on the other hand when i interrogated the peripatetics and the ptolemians 
and out of curiosity i have interrogated not a few respecting their perusal of copernicus work i perceived that there were few who had seen the book and not one who understood it nor have i omitted to enquire among the followers of the peripatetic doctrines if any of them had ever stood on the opposite side and the result was there was not one considering then that nobody followed the copernican doctrine who had not previously held the contrary opinion and who was not well acquainted with the arguments of aristotle and ptolemy while on the other hand nobody followed the ptolemy and aristotle who had before adhered to copernicus and had gone over from him to the camp of aristotle weighing i say these things i began to believe that if any one who rejects an opinion which he was imbibed with this milk and which has been embraced by an infinite number shall take up an opinion held only by a few condemned by all schools and really regarded as a great paradox it cannot be doubted that he must have been induced not to say driven to embrace it by the most cogent arguments on this account i have become very curious to penetrate to the very bottom of the subject it appears on the testimony of galileo himself that he thought the ptolemaic system in the compliance with the popular feeling after he had convinced himself of the truth of the copernican doctrines in the treatise on the sphere indeed which bears his name and which must have been written soon after he went to padua and subsequently to 1592 the stability of the earth and the motion of the sun are supported by the very arguments which galileo afterwards ridiculed but we have no means of determining whether or not he had then adopted the true system of the universe although he might have thought the ptolemaic system in his lecture after he had convinced himself of its falsehood yet it is not likely that he would go so far as to publish to the world as true the very doctrines which he despised in a letter to kepler dated 1597 he distinctly states that he had many years ago adopted the opinions of copernicus but that he had not yet dared to publish his arguments in favor of them and his refutation of the opposite opinions these facts would leave us to place galileo's conversion somewhere between 1593 and 1597 although many years cannot be said to have elapsed between these two dates at this early period of galileo's life in 1593 he met with an accident which had nearly proved fatal a party at padua of which he was one were enjoying at an open window a current of air which was artificially cooled by a fall of water galileo unfortunately fell asleep under its influence and so powerful was its effect upon his robust constitution that he contracted a severe chronic disorder accompanied with acute pains in his body and loss of sleep and appetite which attacked him at intervals during the rest of his life others of the party suffered still more severely and perished by their own rashness galileo's reputation was now widely extended over europe the archduke ferdinand afterwards emperor of germany the landgrave of hesse and the princes of alsace and mantua honored his lectures with their presence and the prince gustavus adolphus of sweden also received instructions from him in mathematics during his sojourn in italy when galileo had completed the first period of his engagement at padua he was re-elected for another six years with an increased salary of three hundred and twenty florins this liberal addition to his income is ascribed to fabroni to the malice of one of his enemies who informed the senate that galileo was living in illicit intercourse with marina gamba without inquiring into the truth of the accusation the senate is said to have replied that if he had a family to support he had more need of an increased salary it was more likely that the liberality of the republic had been called forth by the high reputation of their professor and the terms of their reply were intended only to rebuke the malignity of the informer the mode of expression would seem to indicate that one or more of galileo's children had been born previous to his re-election in 1598 but as this is scarcely consistent with other facts we are disposed to doubt the authenticity of fabroni's anecdote the new star which attracted the notice of astronomers in 1604 excited the particular attention of galileo the observations which he made upon it and the speculations which they suggested formed the subject of three lectures the beginning of the first of which only has reached our times from the absence of the parallax he proved that the common hypothesis of its being a meteor was erroneous and that like the fixed stars it was situated far beyond the bounds of our own system 
the popularity of the subject attracted crowds to his lecture room and galileo had the boldness to reproach his hearers for taking so deep an interest in a temporary phenomenon while they overlooked the wonders of creation which were daily presented to their view in the year sixteen o six galileo was again appointed to the professorship of padua with an augmented stipend of five hundred and twenty florins his popularity had now risen so high that his audience could not be accommodated in his lecture room and even when he had assembled them in school of medicine which contained thousand persons he was frequently obliged to adjourn to the open air among the variety of pursuits which occupied his attention was the examination of the properties of lodestone in sixteen o seven he commenced his experiments but with the exception of the method of arming lodestones which according to the report of sir kenlam digby enabled them to carry twice as much weight as before he does not seem to have made any additions to our knowledge of magnetism he appears to have studied with care the admirable work of our countryman dr gilbert the magnet which was published in sixteen hundred and he recognized in the experiments and reasonings of the english philosopher the principles of that method of investigating truth which he had himself adopted gilbert died in sixteen o three in the sixty-third year of his age and probably never read the fine compliment which was paid to him by the italian philosopher i extremely praise admire and envy this author End of chapter 1 Read by Lambda Chapter 2 of The Martyrs of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Martyrs of Science by david brewster life of galileo chapter two cosmo grand duke of tuscany invites galileo to pisa galileo visits venice in sixteen o nine very first years of the telescope he invents and constructs one which excites a great sensation discovers mountains in the moon and forty stars in the pleiades discovers jupiter's satellites in sixteen ten effect of this discovery on kepler manner in which these discoveries were received galileo appointed mathematician to cosmo mayer claims the discovery of the satellites of jupiter harriot observes them in england in october sixteen ten in the preceding chapter we brought down the history of galileo's labours to that auspicious year in which he first directed the telescope to the heavens no sooner was this noble instrument placed in his hands than providence released him from his professional toils and supplied him with the fullest leisure and the amplest means for pursuing and completing the grandest discoveries although he had quitted the service and the domains of his munificent patron the grand duke of tuscany yet he maintained his connection with the family by visiting florence during his academic vacations and giving mathematical instruction to the younger branches of that distinguished house cosmo who had been one of his pupils now succeeded his father ferdinand and having his mind early imbued with the love of knowledge which had become hereditary in his family he felt that the residence of galileo within his dominions and still more his introduction to his household would do honour to their common country and reflect a lustre upon his own name in the year sixteen o nine accordingly cosmo made proposals to galileo to return to his original situation at pisa these overtures were gratefully received and in the arrangements which galileo on this occasion suggested as well as in the manner in which they were urged we obtain some insight into his temper and character he informs the correspondent through whom cosmo's offer was conveyed that his salary of five twenty florins at padua would be increased to as many crowns at his re-election and that he would enlarge his income to any extent he pleased by giving private lectures and receiving pupils his public duties he stated occupied him only sixty half hours in the year but his studies suffered such interruptions from his domestic pupils and private lectures that his most ardent wish was to be relieved from them in order that he might have sufficient rest and leisure before the close of his life to finish and publish those great works which he had projected in the event therefore of his returning to pisa 
he hoped that it would be the first object of his serene highness to give him leisure to complete his works without the drudgery of lecturing he expresses his anxiety to gain his bread by his writings and he promises to dedicate them to his serene master he enumerates among these books two on the system of universe three on local motion three books on mechanics two on the demonstration of principles and one of problems besides treatises on sound and speech on light and colours on the tides on the composition of the continuous quantity on the motion of animals and on the military art on the subject of his salary he makes the following curious observations i say nothing says he on the amount of my salary being convinced that as i am to live upon it the graciousness of his highness would not deprive me of any of those comforts of which however i feel the want of less than many others and therefore i say nothing more on the subject finally on the title and the profession of my service i should wish that to the title of the mathematician his highness would add that of philosopher as i profess to have studied a great number of years in philosophy then months in pure mathematics and now i have profited by it and i can for aught to deserve this title i may let their highnesses see as often as it pleases them to give me an opportunity of discussing such subjects in their presence with those who are most esteemed in this knowledge during the progress of this negotiation galileo went to venice on a visit to a friend in the month of april or may sixteen o nine here he learned from a common rumour that a dutchman had presented to prince maurice of nassau an optical instrument which possessed the singular property of causing distant objects to appear nearer to the observer the dutchman was hans or john lepache who as has been clearly proved by the late professor moll of utrecht was in the possession of a telescope made by himself so early as second october sixteen o eight a few days afterwards the truth of this report was confirmed by a letter which galileo received from james bordurer at paris and he immediately applied himself to the consideration of the subject on the first night after his return to padua he found in the doctrines of refraction the principle which he sought he placed at the ends of a leaden tube two spectacle glasses both of which were plain on one side while one of them had its other side convex and the other its second side concave and having applied his eye to the concave glass he saw objects pretty large and pretty near him this little instrument which magnified only three times he carried in triumph to venice where it excited the most intense interest crowds of principal citizens flocked to his house to see the magical toy and after nearly a month had been spent in gratifying this epidemical curiosity galileo was led to understand from leonardo diodati the doge of venice that the senate would be highly gratified by obtaining possession of such an extraordinary instrument galileo instantly complied with the wishes of his patrons who acknowledged the present by a mandate conferring upon him for life his professorship at padua and generally raising his salary from five hundred and twenty to one thousand florins although we cannot doubt the veracity of galileo when he affirms that he had never seen any of the dutch telescopes yet it expressly stated by Fucurius that one of these instruments had at this time been brought to florence and citrus assures us that a frenchman calling himself a partner of the dutch inventor came to milan in may sixteen o nine and offered a telescope to the count of fuentes in a letter from lorenzo pignora to paolo gualdo dated from padua on thirty first of august sixteen o nine it is expressly said that at the re-election of the professors galileo had contrived to obtain one thousand florins for life which was alleged to be on the account of an eyeglass like the one which was sent from flanders to cardinal borghese in a memoir so brief and general at present it would be out of place to discuss the history of this extraordinary invention we have no hesitation in asserting that a method of magnifying distant objects was known to baptista porta and others but it seems to be equally certain that an instrument for producing these effects was first constructed in holland and that it was from that kingdom that galileo derived the knowledge of its existence in considering the contending claims which have been urged with all this ardour and partiality of the national feeling it has been generally overlooked that a single convex lens whose focal length exceeds the distance at which we examine minute objects performs the part of a telescope when an eye placed behind it 
sees distinctly the inverted image which it forms a lens twenty feet in focal length will in this manner magnify twenty times and it was by the same principle that sir william herschel discovered a new satellite of saturn by using only the mirror of his forty feet telescope the instrument presented to prince morris and which marquis spinola found in the shop of john lepache the spectacle maker of middleburg must have been an astronomical telescope consisting of two convex lenses upon this supposition it differed from that which galileo constructed and the italian philosopher will be justly entitled to the honour of having invented that form of the telescope which still bears his name while we must accord to the dutch optician the honour of having previously invented the astronomical telescope the interest which the exhibition of the telescope excited at venice did not soon subside Sirturi describes it as amounting almost to frenzy when he himself had succeeded in making one of these instruments he ascended the tower of st mark where he might use it without molestation he was recognized however by a crowd in the street and such was the eagerness of their curiosity that they took possession of the wondrous tube and detained the impatient philosopher for several hours till they had successively witnessed its effects desirous of obtaining the same gratification for their friends they endeavoured to learn the name of the inn at which he lodged but sitteri unfortunately overheard their inquiries and quitted venice early next morning in order to avoid a second visitation of this new school of philosophers the opticians speedily availed themselves of the new instrument galileo's tube or the double eye glass or the cylinder or trunk as it was then called for demisiano had not yet given it the appellation of telescope was manufactured in great quantities and in a very superior manner the instruments were purchased merely as philosophical toys and were carried by travellers into every corner of europe the art of grinding and polishing lenses was at this time very imperfect galileo and those whom he instructed were alone capable of making tolerable instruments it appears from the testimony of gassendi and gartner that in sixteen thirty four a good telescope could not be procured in paris venice or amsterdam and that even in sixteen thirty seven there was not one in holland which could shew jupiter's disc well defined after galileo had completed his first instrument which magnified only three times he executed a larger and better one with a power of about eight at length as he himself remarks sparing neither labour nor expense he constructed an instrument so excellent that it bore a magnifying power of more than thirty times the first celestial object to which galileo applied his telescope was the moon which to use his own words appeared as near as it had been distant only two semi diameters of the earth he then directed it to the planets and fixed stars which he frequently observed with incredible delight the observations which he made upon the moon possessed a high degree of interest the general resemblance of its surface to that of our own globe naturally fixed his attention and he was soon able to trace in almost every part of the lunar disk ranges of mountains deep hollows and other inequalities which reverberated from their summits and margins the rays of the rising sun while the intervening hollows were still buried in the darkness the dark and luminous spaces he regarded as indicating seas and continents which reflected in different degrees the incidental light of the sun and he ascribed this phosphorescence as it was being improperly called or the secondary light which is seen from the dark limb of the moon in her first and last quarters to the reflection of the sun's light from the earth these discoveries were ill received by the followers of aristotle according to their preconceived opinions the moon was perfectly spherical and absolutely smooth and to cover it with mountains and scoop it out into valleys was an act of impiety which defaced the regular forms which nature herself had imprinted it was in vain that galileo appealed to the evidence of observation and to the actual surface of our own globe the very irregularities on the moon were in his opinion the proof of divine wisdom and had its surface been absolutely smooth it would have been but a vast unblessed desert void of animals of plants of cities and of men the abode of silence and inaction senseless lifeless soulless and stripped of all those ornaments which are now to render it so varied and so beautiful in examining the fixed stars and comparing them with the planets 
galileo observed a remarkable difference in the appearance of their discs all the planets appeared with round globular discs like the moon while the fixed stars never exhibited any disc at all but resembled lucid points sending forth twinkling rays stars of all magnitude he found to have the same appearance those of the fifth and the sixth magnitude having the same character when seen through a telescope as sirius the largest of the stars when seen by the naked eye upon directing his telescope to nebulae and clusters of stars he was delighted to find that they consisted of great number of stars which could not be recognized by unassisted vision he counted no fewer than forty in the cluster called pleiades or seven stars and he was giving us drawings of this constellation as well as the belt and the sword of orion and of the nebula of prespe in the great nebula of the milky way he described crowds of minute stars and he concluded that this singular portion of the heavens derived its whiteness from still smaller stars which his telescope was unable to separate important and interesting as these discoveries were they were thrown into the shade by those to which he was led during an accurate examination of the planets with a more powerful telescope on the seventh of january sixteen ten at one o'clock in the morning when he directed his telescope to jupiter he observed three stars near the body of the planet two being to the east and one to the west of him they were all in a straight line and parallel to the ecliptic and appeared brighter than other stars of the same magnitude believing them to be fixed stars he paid no great attention to their distance from jupiter and from one another on the eighth of january however when for some cause or other he had been led to observe the stars again he found a very different arrangement of them all the three were on the west side of jupiter nearer one another than before and almost at equal distances though he had not turned his attention to the extraordinary fact of the mutual approach of the stars yet he began to consider how jupiter could be found at the east of three stars when but the day before he had been to the west of two of them the only explanation which he could give to the fact was that the motion of jupiter was direct contrary to the astronomical calculations and that he had got before these two stars by his own motion in the dilemma between the testimony of his senses and the results of calculation he waited for the following night with the utmost anxiety but his hopes were disappointed for the heavens were wholly veiled in clouds on the tenth only two of the stars appeared and both on the east of the planet as it was obviously impossible that jupiter could have advanced from west to east on the eighth of january and from east to west on the tenth galileo was forced to conclude that the phenomenon which he had observed arose from the motion of the stars and he set himself to observe diligently their change of the place on the eleventh there were still only two stars and both to the east of jupiter but the more eastern star was not twice as large as the other one though on the preceding night they had been perfectly equal this fact threw a new light upon galileo's difficulties and he immediately drew the conclusion which he considered to be indubitable that there were in heavens three stars which revolved around jupiter in the same manner as venus and mercury revolve around the sun on the twelfth of january you again observed them in new positions and of different magnitudes and on the thirteenth he discovered a fourth star which completed the four secondary planets with which jupiter is surrounded galileo continued his observations on these bodies every clear night till twenty second of march and studied their motions in reference to the fixed stars that were at the same time within the field of his telescope having thus clearly established that four new stars were satellites or moons which revolved around jupiter in the same manner as the moon revolves around our own globe he drew up an account of his discovery in which he saw that four new bodies the names of the medician stars in the honour of his patron cosmo the medici grand duke of tuscany this work under the title of nunicius sidereus or the sidereal messenger was dedicated to the same prince and the dedication bears the date of twenty fourth of march only two days after he concluded his observations the importance of this great discovery was instantly felt by the enemies as well as by the friends of the copernican system the planets had hitherto been distinguished from the fixed stars only by their relative change of place but the telescope proved them to be the bodies so near to our own globe as to exhibit well-defined discs while the fixed stars retain even when magnified the minuteness of remote and lucid points the system of jupiter illuminated by four moons performing their revolutions in different and regular periods 
exhibited to the proud reason of man the comparative insignificance of the globe he inhabits and proclaimed his impressive language that the globe was not the centre of the universe the reception which these discoveries met with from kepler is highly interesting and characteristic of the genius of the great man he was one day sitting idle and thinking of galileo when his friend wackenfels stopped his carriage at his door to communicate to him the intelligence such a fit of wonder says he seized me at a report which seems to be so very absurd and i was thrown into such agitation at seeing an old dispute between us decided in this way that between his joy my colouring and the laughter of both confounded as we were by such a novelty we were hardly capable he of speaking or i of listening on our parting i immediately began to think how there could be any addition to the number of planets without overturning my cosmographic mystery according to which euclid's five regular solids do not allow more than six planets around the sun i am so far from disbelieving the existence of four circumjovial planets that i long for a telescope to anticipate you if possible in discovering two round mars as the proportion seems to require six or eight round saturn and perhaps one each round mercury and venus in a very different spirit did the aristotelians receive the sidereal messenger of galileo the principal professor of philosophy at padua resisted galileo's repeated and urgent entreaties to look at the moon and planets through his telescope and he even laboured to convince the grand duke that the satellites of jupiter could not possibly exist sizi an astronomer of florence maintained that there was only seven apertures in the head two eyes two ears two nostrils and one mouth and as there were only seven metals and seven days in the week so there could only be seven planets he seems however to have admitted the visibility of the four satellites through the telescope but he argues that they are invisible to the naked eye they can exercise no influence on the earth and being useless they do not therefore exist a prodigy of kepler's of the name hockey wrote a volume against galileo's discovery after having declared that he would never concede his four new planets to that italian from padua even if he should die for it this resolute aristotelian was at no loss for arguments he asserted that he had examined the heavens through galileo's own glass and that no such thing as a satellite existed round jupiter he affirmed that he did not more surely know that he had a soul in his body than that the reflected rays are the sole cause of galileo's erroneous observations and that the only use of the new planet was to gratify galileo's thirst for gold and offer to himself a subject of discussion when horky first presented himself to kepler after the publication of this work the opinion of his pattern was announced to him by a burst of indignation which overwhelmed the astonished author horky supplicated mercy for this offence and as kepler himself informed galileo he took him again into favour on the condition that kepler was to show him jupiter's satellites and that orchi was not only to see them but to admit their existence when the spirit of philosophy had thus left the individuals who bore so unworthily her sacred name it was fortunate for science that it found a refuge among princes notwithstanding a reiterated logic of his philosophical professor at padua cosmo de medici preferred the testimony of his senses to the syllogisms of his instructor he observed the new planets several times along with galileo at pisa and when he parted with him he gave him his present worth more than thousand florins and concluded that liberal arrangement to which he had already referred as philosopher and principal mathematician to the grand duke of tuscany galileo now took up his residence at florence with a salary of thousand florins no official duties excepting that of lecturing occasionally to sovereign princes were attached to this appointment and it was expressly stipulated that he should enjoy the most perfect leisure to complete his treatises on the constitution of the universe on mechanics and on local motion the resignation of his professorship in the university of padua which was the necessary consequence of this new appointment created much dissatisfaction but though many of his former friends refused at first to hold any communication with him this excitement gradually subsided and the venetian senate at last appreciated his feelings as well as the motives which induced a stranger to accept of promotion in his native land while galileo was enjoying the reward and the fame of his great discovery a new species of enmity was roused against him 
simon mayer an astronomer of no character pretended that he had discovered the satellites of jupiter before galileo and that his first observation was made on the twenty ninth of december sixteen o nine other astronomers announced the discovery of new satellites shiner reckoned five rahita nine and others found even as many as twelve these satellites however were found only to be fixed stars the names of vladislavian agrippin uranodavian and ferdinando tertian which were hastily given to these common telescopic stars soon disappeared from the page of science and even the splendid telescope of modern times have not been able to add another gem to the diadem of jupiter a modern astronomer of no mean celebrity has even in the present day endeavoured to rob galileo of the staple article of his reputation from a careless examination of the papers of our celebrated countryman thomas harriot which baron sack has made in seventeen eighty four at petworth the seat of lord egremont this astronomer has asserted that harriot first observed the satellites of jupiter on the sixteenth of january sixteen ten and continued his observations till twenty fifth of february sixteen twelve Baron Zach adds the following extraordinary conclusion galileo pretends to have discovered them on the seventh of january sixteen ten so that it is improbable that harriot was likewise the first discoverer of these attendants of jupiter in a communication which i received from dr robertson of oxford in eighteen twenty two he informed me that he had examined a portion of harriot's papers entitled de joviabilis planetis and that it appears from the two pages of these papers that harriot first observed jupiter's satellites on the seventeenth of october sixteen ten these observations were accompanied with rough drawings of the positions of the satellites and the rough calculations of their periodical revolutions my friend professor rigward who has very recently examined the harriot manuscripts has confirmed the accuracy of dr robertson's observations and has thus restored to galileo the honour of being the first and the sole discoverer of these secondary planets End of chapter 2 Read by Lambda Chapter 3 of The Martyrs of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Martyrs of Science by David Brewster life of galileo chapter three galileo announces his discoveries in enigmas discovers the crescent of venus the rings of saturn the spots on the sun similar observations made in england by harriet claims of fabricius and china to the discovery of the solar spots galileo's letter to welser on the claims of china his residence at the villa of salviati composes his works on floating bodies which involves him in new controversies the great success which attended the first telescopic observations of galileo induced him to apply his best instruments to the other planets of our system the attempts which had been made to deprive him of the honour of some of his discoveries combined probably with the desire to repeat his observations with better telescopes led him to announce his discoveries under the veil of an enigma and to invite astronomers to declare within a given time if they had observed any phenomena in the heavens before the close of sixteen ten galileo excited the curiosity of astronomers by the publication of his first enigma kepler and others tried in vain to decipher it but in consequence of the emperor rudolph requesting a solution to the puzzle galileo sent him the following clue altissima planetum terraginem observavi i have observed that the most remote planet is triple in explaining more fully the nature of his observation galileo remarked that saturn was not a single star but three altogether nearly touching one another he described them as having no relative motion and as having the form of three o's namely o o o the central one being the larger than those on the each side of it although galileo had announced that nothing new appeared in other planets yet he soon communicated to the world another discovery of no slight interest the enigmatical letters in which it was concealed formed the following sentence cynthia figuras amulator mater amorum venus rivals the phases of the moon 
hitherto galileo had observed venus when her disk was largely illuminated but having directed his telescope to see her when she was not far removed from the sun he saw her in the form of a crescent resembling exactly the moon at the same elongation he continued to observe her night after night during the whole time that she could be seen in the course of her revolution around the sun and he found that she exhibited the very same phases which resulted from her motion round the luminary galileo had long contemplated a visit to the metropolis of italy and he accordingly carried his intentions into the effect in the early part of the year sixteen hundred and eleven here he was received with the distinction that was due to his great talents and his extended reputation princes cardinals and prelates hastened to do him honour and even those who discredited his discoveries and dreaded their results weighed with their true friends of science in their anxiety to see the intellectual wonder of the age in order to show the new celestial phenomenon to his friends at rome galileo took with him his best telescope and as he had discovered the spots of sun's surface in october or november sixteen hundred and ten or even earlier he had the gratification of exhibiting them to his admiring disciples he accordingly erected his telescope in the quarinal garden belonging to cardinal bandini and in april sixteen hundred and eleven he showed them to his friends in many of their most interesting variations from the change of position on the sun's disk galileo at first inferred either that the sun revolved about an axis or that other planets like venus and mercury revolved so near the sun as to appear like black spots when they were opposite to his disk upon continuing his observations however he saw a reason to abandon this hasty opinion he found that the spots must be in contact with the surface of the sun that their figures were irregular that they had a different degrees of darkness that one spot would often divide itself into three or four that the three or four spots would unite themselves into one and that all the spots revolved regularly with the sun which appeared to complete its revolution in about twenty-eight days previous to the invention of telescope spots had been more than one seen on the sun's disk with unassisted eye but even if these were the same character as those which galileo and others observed we cannot consider them as anticipations of the discovery by the telescope as the telescope was now in possession of several astronomers galileo began to have many rivals in discovery but notwithstanding the claims of harriet fabricius and shiner it is now placed beyond the reach of doubt that he was the first discoverer of the solar spots from the communication which received in eighteen twenty two from the late dr robertson of oxford it appeared that thomas harriet had observed the solar spots on eighth of december sixteen hundred and ten but his manuscripts in lord egremont's possession incontestably prove that this regular observation on the spots did not commence till december one sixteen hundred and eleven although he had seen the spots at the date above mentioned and that he had continued till eighteenth of january sixteen hundred and thirteen the observations which he has recorded are one hundred and ninety nine in number and the accounts of them are accompanied with rough drawings representing the number position and magnitude of the spots in the observation of harriet made on eighth december sixteen hundred and ten before he knew of galileo's discovery he saw three spots on the sun which he has represented in a diagram the sun was then seven degree or eight degree high and there was a frost and a mist which no doubt acted as a darkening glass harriet does not apply the name of spots to what he noticed in his observation and he does not enumerate it among the hundred and ninety nine observations above mentioned professor rigard considers it a misapplication of terms to call such an observation a discovery with all the respect we feel for the candour of this remark we are disposed to confer on harriet the merit of an original discoverer of the spots on the sun another candidate for the honour of discovering the spots of the sun was john fabricius who undoubtedly saw them previous to june sixteen eleven the dedication of the work in which he has recorded his observations bears the date of the thirteenth of june sixteen hundred and eleven and it is obvious from the work itself that he had seen the spots about the end of the year sixteen hundred and ten but as there is no proof that he saw them before october we are compelled to assign the priority of the discovery to the italian astronomer the claim of shiner the professor of mathematics at ingolstadt is more intimately connected with the history of galileo this learned astronomer having early in sixteen hundred and eleven turned his telescope to the sun necessarily discovered the spots which at the time covered his disk 
light flying clouds happened at the time to weaken the intensity of his light so that he was able to show the spots to his pupils these observations were not published till sixteen hundred and twelve and they appeared in the form of three letters addressed to mark welser one of the magistrates of augsburg under the signature of appellus postabulum skyner who many years afterwards published an elaborate work on the subject adopted the same idea which had at first occurred to galileo that the spots were dark sides of planets revolving round and near the sun on the publication of Skyner's letters, Welser transmitted a copy of them to his friend Galileo, with the request that he had favor him with his opinion of new phenomena. After some delay, Galileo addressed three letters to Welser, in which he compared the opinions of Skyner as the cause of the spots. The first of these letters was dated the 4th of May, 1612, but though the controversy was carried on in a language of mutual respect and esteem, it put an end to the friendship which had existed between the two astronomers. In these letters, Galileo showed that the spots often dispersed like vapors or clouds, that they sometimes had a duration of only one or two days, and at other times thirty or forty days, that they contracted in their breadth when they approached the sun's limb without any diminution of their length, that they describe circles parallel to each other, that the monthly rotation of the sun again brings the same spots into view, and that they are seldom seen at a greater distance than thirty degrees from the sun's equator. Galileo likewise discovered on the sun's disk Feculi or luculi, as they were called, which differ in no respect from the common ones, but in their being brighter than the rest of the sun's surface. In the last of the letters which our author addressed to Welser, and which was written in December 1612, he recurs to his former discovery of the elongated shape, or rather the triple structure of Saturn. The singular figure which he had observed in this planet had entirely disappeared, and he evidently announces the fact to Welser lest it should be used by his enemies to discredit the accuracy of his observations. Looking on Saturn, says he, within these days I found it solitary, without the assistance to its accustomed stars, and in short, perfectly round and defined like Jupiter, and such it still remains. Now, what can be said of so strange a metamorphosis? Are the two smaller stars consumed like the spots on the sun? Have they suddenly vanished and fled? or a Saturn devoured his own children? Or was the appearance indeed fraud and illusion, with which the glasses have for long time mocked me, and so many others who have often observed with me? Now, perhaps, the time has come to revive the withering hopes of those who, guided by more profound contemplations, have followed all fallacies of the new observations, and recognized their impossibilities. I cannot resolve what to say in chance of so strange so new and so unexpected the shortness of the time the unexampled occurrence the weakness of my intellect and the terror of being mistaken have greatly confounded me although galileo struggled to obtain a solution to this mystery yet he had not the good fortune to succeed he imagined that the two smaller stars would reappear in consequence of the supposed revolution of the planet round its axis but the discovery of the ring of saturn and of the obliquity of its plane to the ecliptic was necessary to explain the phenomena which were so perplexing to our author the ill health to which galileo was occasionally subject and the belief that the heir of florence was prejudicial to his complaints induced him to spend much of his time at cell the villa of his friend salviati the eminent individual had ever been the warmest friend of galileo and seems to have delighted in drawing round him the scientific genius of the age he was the member of the celebrated Lynchian society, founded by the prince Frederico Cesci, and though he is not known as the author of any important discovery, yet he has earned, by his liberality to the science, a glorious name which will be indissolubly united with the immortal destiny of Galileo. The subject of floating bridges have been discussed at one of the scientific parties which had assembled at the house of Salviati, a difference of opinion arose respecting the influence of the shape of the bodies on their disposition to float or to sink in a fluid contrary to general opinion galileo undertook to prove that it depended on other causes and he was thus led to compose his discourse on floating bodies which was published in sixteen hundred and twelve and dedicated to cosmo de medici this work contains many ingenious experiments and much acute reasoning in support of the true principles of hydrostatics 
and it is now chiefly remarkable as a specimen of the sagacity and intellectual power of its author like all his other works it encountered the most violent opposition and galileo was more than once summoned into the field to repel the aggressions of his ignorant and presumptuous opponents the first attack upon it was made by ptolemy nozzolini in a letter to marzi medici archbishop of florence to this galileo replied in a letter addressed to his antagonist a more elaborate examination of it was published by ludovico della colombo and another by monsieur vincenzo di gracia to these attacks a minute and overwhelming answer was printed in the name of benedetti castelli the friend and pupil of galileo but it was discovered some years after galileo's death that he himself was the author of this work end of chapter 3 read by lambda chapter 4 of the martyrs of science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the martyrs of science by david brewster life of galileo chapter 4 galileo treats his opponents with severity and sarcasm he is aided by the skeptics of the day the church party the most powerful galileo commences the attack and is answered by cascini a dominican galileo's letter to the grand duchess of tuscany in support to the motion of the earth and the stability of the sun galileo visits rome is summoned before the inquisition and renounces his opinions as heretical the inquisition denounces the copernican system galileo has an audience of the pope but still maintains his opinions in private society proposes to find out the longitude at sea by means of jupiter's satellites his negotiation on the subject with the court of spain its failure he is unable to observe the three comets in 1618 but is involved in the controversy to which they gave rise the current of galileo's life had at the of flowed in a smooth and unobstructed channel he had now attained the highest objects of the earthly ambition his discoveries had placed him at the head of the great men of the age he possessed a professional income far beyond his wants and even beyond his anticipations and what is still dearer to a philosopher he enjoyed the most perfect leisure for carrying on and completing his discoveries the opposition which these discoveries encountered was to him more a subject for triumph than for sorrow prejudice and ignorance were his only enemies and if they succeeded for a while in harassing his march it was only to lay foundation for fresh achievements he who contends for truths which he has himself been permitted to discover may well sustain the conflict in which presumption and error are destined to fall the public tribunal may neither be sufficiently pure nor enlightened to decide upon the issue but he can appeal to posterity and reckon with a confidence on a sure decree the ardor of galileo's mind the keenness of his temper his clear perception of truth and his inextinguishable love of it combined to exasperate and prolong the hostility of his enemies when argument failed to enlighten their judgment and reason to dispel their prejudices he wielded against them his powerful weapons of ridicule and sarcasm served out and his unrelenting warfare he seems to have forgotten that providence had withheld from his enemies those very gifts which he had so liberally received he who is allowed to take the start of a species and penetrate the veil which conceals from common minds the mysteries of nature must not expect that the world will be patiently dragged at chariot wheels of his philosophy mind has its inertia as well as matter and its progress to truth can only be ensured by the gradual and patient removal of obstructions which surround it the boldness may we not say the recklessness with which galileo insisted upon making proselytes of his enemies served but to alienate them from the truth error thus assailed speedily entrenched themselves in general feelings and become embalmed in the virulence of the passions the various classes of his opponents marshalled themselves for their mutual defence the aristotelian professors the temporizing jesuits the political churchmen 
and the timid but respectable body who at all times dread innovation whether it be in religion or in science entered into an alliance against the philosophical tyrant who threatened them with the penalties of knowledge the party of galileo though weak in numbers was not without power and influence he had trained round him a devoted band who idolized his genius and cherished his doctrines his pupils had been appointed to several of the principal professorships in italy the enemies of the religion were on occasion united with christian philosopher and there were even in these days many princes and nobles who had felt the inconvenience of ecclesiastical jurisdiction and who secretly abated galileo in his crusade against established errors although these two parties had been long dreading each other's powers and reconnoitring each other's positions yet we cannot directly determine which of them hoisted the first signal for war the church party particularly its highest dignitaries were certainly disposed to rest on the defensive flanked on one side by the logic of the schools and on the other by the popular interpretation of the scripture and backed by the strong arm of the civil power they were not disposed to interfere with the prosecution of science however much they had dreaded its influence the philosophers on the contrary united the zeal of innovators with that firmness of purpose which truth alone can inspire victorious in every contest they were flushed with success and they panted for a struggle in which they knew they must triumph in the state of warlike preparation galileo addressed a letter in sixteen thirteen to his friend and pupil the abbe castelli the object of which was to prove that the scriptures were not intended to teach us science and philosophy hence he inferred that the language employed in the sacred volume as reference to such subjects should be interpreted only in its common acceptation and that it was in reality as difficult to reconcile the ptolemaic as the copernican system to the expressions which occur in bible a demonstration was about this time made by the opposite party in the person of cascini a dominican friar who made a personal attack upon galileo from the pulpit this violent ecclesiastic ridiculed the astronomer and his followers by addressing them sarcastically in the sacred language of the scripture ye men of galileo why stand ye here looking up into the heaven but this species of warfare was disapproved of even by the church and luigi marafi the general of the dominicans not only apologized to galileo who had transmitted to him a formal complaint against cascini but expressed the acuteness of his own feelings of being implicated in the brutal conduct of thirty or forty thousand monks from the character of cascini and the part which he afterwards played in the persecution of galileo we can scarcely avoid the opinion that his attack from the pulpit was intended as a snare for the unwary philosopher it roused galileo from his wonted caution and stimulated no doubt by the nature of the answer which he received from the marafi he published a long letter of seventy pages defending and illustrating his former views respecting the influence of the scriptural language on the two contending systems as if to give the impress of royal authority to his own new appeal he addressed it to christian grand duchess of tuscany the mother of cosmo and in this form it seems to have excited a new interest as if it had expressed the opinion of a grand ducal family these external circumstances gave additional weight to the powerful and unanswerable reasoning which this letter contains and it was scarcely possible that any man possessed of a sound mind and willing to learn the truth should refuse his assent to the judicious view of our author he expresses belief that the scriptures were designed to instruct mankind respecting their salvation and that the faculties of our mind were given to us for the purpose of investigating the phenomena of nature he considers scripture and nature as proceeding from the same divine author and therefore incapable of speaking a different language and he points out the absurdity of supposing that professors of astronomy will shut their eyes to the phenomena which they discover in the heavens or will refuse to believe those deductions of reason which appeal to their judgment with all the power of demonstration he supports these views by quotations from ancient fathers and he refers to the dedication of copernicus's own work to the roman pontiff paul iii as a proof that the pope himself did not regard the new system of world 
as hostile to the sacred writings copernicus on the contrary tells his holiness that the reason for inscribing to him his new system was that the authority of pontiff might put to silence calumnities of some individuals who attack it by arguments drawn from the passages of scripture twisted for their own purpose it was in vain to meet such reasoning by other weapons than those of civil power the enemies of galileo saw that they must crush the dangerous innovation or allow its fullest scope and they determined upon their appeal to the inquisition lorini a monk of dominican order had already denounced to this body of galileo's letter to castelli and cascini bribed by mastership of the convent of samari of minerva was invited to settle at rome for the purpose of embodying the evidence against galileo though these plans had been carried on in secret yet galileo's suspicions were excited and he obtained leave from cosmo to go to rome about the end of sixteen fifteen here he was lodged in the palace of the grand duke's ambassador and kept up a constant correspondence with the family of his patron at florence but in the midst of this external splendour he was summoned before the inquisition to answer for the heretical doctrines which he had published he was charged with maintaining the motion of the earth and the stability of the sun with teaching this doctrine to his pupils with corresponding on the subject with several german mathematicians and with having published it and attempted to reconcile it to the scripture in his letters to mark welser in sixteen hundred and twelve the inquisition assembled to consider these charges on the twenty fifth of february sixteen fifteen and it was decreed that galileo should be enjoined by cardinal bellarmine to renounce the obnoxious doctrines and to pledge himself that he would neither teach defend nor publish them in future in the event of his refusing to acquiesce in this sentence it was decreed that he should be thrown into prison galileo did not hesitate to yield to this injunction on the day following the twenty sixth of february he appeared before the cardinal bellarmine to renounce his heretical opinions and having declared that he had abandoned the doctrine on the earth's motion and would neither defend nor teach it in his conversation or in his writing he was dismissed from the bar of the inquisition having thus disposed of galileo the inquisition conceived the design of condemning the whole system of copernicus as heretical galileo with more hardihood than prudence remained at rome for the purpose of giving his assistance in frustrating this plan but there is reason to think that he injured by his presence the very cause which he meant to support the inquisitors had determined to put down the new opinions they now inserted among the prohibited books galileo's letters to castelli and the grand duchess kepler's epitome on the copernican theory and copernicus's own work on the revolutions of the heavenly bodies notwithstanding these proceedings galileo had an audience of the pope paul v in march sixteen sixteen he was received very graciously and spent nearly an hour with his holiness when they were about to part the pope assured galileo that the congregation were not disposed to receive upon light grounds any calumnies which might be propagated by his enemies and that as long as he occupied the papal chair he might consider himself as safe these assurances were no doubt founded on the belief that galileo would adhere to his pledges but so bold and inconsiderate was he in the expression of his opinions that even in rome he was continually engaged in controversial discussions the following very interesting account of these disputes is given by curengi in a letter to cardinal dest your eminence would be delighted with galileo if you heard him folding forth as he often does in the midst of fifteen or twenty all violently attacking him sometime in one house sometime in another but he is armed after such fashion that he laughs all of them to scorn and even if the novelty of his opinion prevents entire persuasion he at least convicts of emptiness most of the arguments with which his adversaries endeavour to overwhelm him he was particularly admirable on monday last in the house of signor frederico gillesiri and what especially pleased me was that before replying to the contrary arguments he amplified and enforced them with new grounds of great plausibility so as to leave his adversaries in a more ridiculous plight when he afterwards overturned them all the discovery of jupiter's satellite suggested to galileo a new method of finding the longitude at sea philip third had encouraged astronomers to direct their attention to this problem by offering a reward for its solution 
and in those days when new discoveries in science were sometimes rejected as injurious to mankind it was no common event to see a powerful sovereign courting the assistance of astronomers and promoting the commercial interests of this empire galileo seems to have regarded the solution of this problem as an object worthy of his ambition and he no doubt anticipated the triumph which he would obtain over his enemies in the medician stars which they are treated with such contempt could be made subservient to the great interests of mankind during his residence at rome in sixteen fifteen and sixteen sixteen galileo had communicated his views on the subject to comte de limos the viceroy of naples who had presided over the council of the spanish indies this nobleman advised him to apply to the spanish minister the duke of lerma and through the influence of the grand duke cosmo his ambassador at the court of madrid was engaged to manage the affair the anxiety of galileo on the subject was singularly great he assured the tuscan ambassador that in the order to accomplish this object he was ready to leave all his comforts his country his friends and his family to cross over into spain and to stay as long as he might want it at seville or at lisbon or wherever it might be convenient to communicate a knowledge of this method the lethargy of the spanish court seems to have increased the enthusiasm of galileo and though the negotiations were occasionally revived for ten or twelve years yet no steps were taken to bring them to a close the strange procrastination has been generally ascribed to jealousy or indifference on the part of spain but nelly one of galileo's biographers declares on the authority of florentine records that cosmo had privately requested from the government the privilege of sending annually to spanish indies two legon merchantmen free of duty as a compensation for the loss of galileo the failure of this negotiation might have been the source of extreme mortification to high spirit and sanguine temperament of galileo he had calculated however too securely on his means of putting the new method to a successful trial the great imperfection of timekeepers of that day and the want of proper telescopes would have baffled him in all his efforts and he would have been subject to a more serious mortification from the failure and rejection of his plan than that which he actually experienced from the avarice of his patron or the indifference of spain even in present day no telescope has been invented which is capable of observing at sea the eclipses of jupiter's satellites and though this method of finding the longitude was great advantage on shore yet it has been completely abandoned at sea and superseded by easier and more correct methods in the year sixteen eighteen when no fewer than three comets visited our system and attracted attention of all astronomers of europe galileo was unfortunately confined to his bed by a severe illness but though he was unable to make single observation upon these remarkable bodies he contrived to involve himself in controversies which they occasioned marco guiducci an astronomer of florence and a friend of galileo had delivered a discourse on comets before the florentine academy the heads of this discourse which was published in sixteen nineteen were supposed to have been communicated to him by galileo and this seems to have been universally admitted during the controversy to which it gave rise the opinion maintained in this treatise that comets are nothing but meteors which occasionally appear in our atmosphere like halos and rainbows savours so little of the sagacity of galileo that we should be disposed to question his paternity his inability to partake in general interest which these comets excited and to employ his powerful telescope in observing their phenomena and their movements might have had some slight share in the formation of an opinion which deprived them of their importance as celestial bodies but however this may have been the treatise of guidoshi afforded a favourable point of attack to galileo's enemies and the dangerous task was entrusted to horatio grassi a learned jesuit who in the work entitled the astronomical and philosophical balance criticised the discourse on comets under the feigned name of loterio sarsi galileo replied to this attack in a volume entitled il sagittor or the assayer which owing to the state of his health was not published till the autumn of sixteen twenty three this work was written in the form of a letter to virgino cesarini a member of the lynchian academy and master of the chamber of urban eighth who had ascended the papal throne it was dedicated to the pontiff himself and has been long celebrated among literary men for the beauty of its language though it is doubtless one of the least important of galileo's writing 
End of chapter 4 Read by Lambda Chapter 5 of The Martyrs of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Martyrs of Science by David Brewster Life of Galileo Chapter 5 Urban VIII, Galileo's friend, raised to pontificate. Galileo goes to Rome to offer his congratulations. The Pope loads Galileo with presents and promises a pension to his son. Galileo in pecuniary difficulties owing to the death of his patron Cosmo. Galileo again rashly attacks the church, notwithstanding the Pope's kindness. He composes a system of the world to demonstrate the Copernican system. Artfully obtains a license to print it. Nature of the work. Its influence on the public mind. The Pope resolves on suppressing it. Galileo summoned before the Inquisition. His trial. His defense. His formal abjuration of his opinions. Observations on his conduct. The Pope shows great indulgence to Galileo, who is allowed to return to his own house at Archetry as the place of his confinement. The succession of the Cardinal Mafo Barberini to the papal throne under the name of Urban VIII was hailed by Galileo and his friends as an event favorable to the promotion of science. Urban had not only been the personal friend of Galileo and of Prince Sessi, the founder of Lincian Academy, but had been intimately connected with the able and liberal association, and it was therefore deemed prudent to secure his favor and attachment. If Paul III had nearly a century before, patronized Copernicus and accepted of the dedication of his great work, it was not unreasonable to expect that, in more enlightened times, another pontiff might be exhibit the same liberality to science. The plan of securing to Galileo the patronage of Urban VIII seems to have been devised by Prince Sissi. Although Galileo had not been able for some years to travel, excepting in a litter, Yet he was urged by the prince to perform a journey to Rome for the express purpose of congratulating his friend upon his elevation to the papal chair. This request was made on October 1623, and though Galileo's health was not such as to authorize him to undergo so much fatigue, yet he felt the importance of the advice, and, after visiting Sessi at Aquasparta, he arrived at Rome in spring of 1624. The reception which he here experienced far exceeded his most sanguine expectations. During the two months he spent in the capital, he was permitted to have no fewer than six long and gratifying audiences of the Pope. The kindness of his holiness was of the most marked description. He not only loaded Galileo with presents and promised him a pension for his son Vincenzo, but he wrote a letter to Ferdinand, who had just succeeded Cosmo as Grand Duke of Tuscany, recommending Galileo to his particular patronage. For we find in him, says he, not only literary distinction, but the love of piety, and he is so strong in those qualities of which pontifical goodwill is easily obtained. And now, when he has been brought to the city to congratulate us on our elevation, we have very lovingly embraced him, nor can we suffer him to return to the country, whether your liberality recalls him, without an ample provision of pontifical love, and that you may know how dear he is to us, we are well to give him honourable testimonial of our virtue and piety. And we further signify that every benefit which you shall confer upon him, imitating or even surpassing your father's liberality, will conduce to our gratification. Not content with thus securing the friendship of the Pope, Galileo endeavoured to bespeak the goodwill of the cardinals towards the Copernican system. He had, accordingly, many interviews with several of these dignitaries, and he was assured by the Cardinal Hohenzoller that in a representation which he had made to the Pope on the subject of Copernicus, he stated to His Holiness that all the heretics considered that the system was undoubted, 
it would be necessary to be very circumspect in coming to any resolution on the subject to this remark his holiness replied that the church had not condemned the system and that it should not be condemned as heretical but only as rash and he added that there was no fear of any person undertaking to prove that it must necessarily be true the recent appointment of abbe castelli the friend and pupil of galileo to be the mathematician to the pope was an event of most gratifying nature and when we recollect that it was to castelli that he addressed the famous letter which was pronounced heretical by the inquisition we must regard it also as an event indicative of a new and favourable feeling towards the friends of science the opinions of urban indeed had suffered no change he was one of the few cardinals who had opposed to the inquisitorial degree of sixteen sixteen and subsequent demeanour was in every respect comfortable to the liberality of his early views the sincerity of his conduct was still further evinced by grant of a pension of one hundred crowns to galileo a few years after his visit to rome though there is reason to think that this allowance was not regularly paid the death of cosmo whose liberality had given him both affluence and leisure threatened galileo with pecuniary difficulties he had been involved in a great load of debt owing to the circumstances of his brother's family and in order to relieve himself he had requested castelli to dispose of the pension of his son vincenzo in addition to this calamity he was now alarmed with the prospect of losing his salary as an extraordinary professor at pisa the great youth of ferdinand who was scarcely of age induced galileo's enemies in sixteen twenty nine to raise doubts respecting the payment of his salary to a professor who neither resided nor lectured in the university but the question was decided in his favour and we have no doubt that the decision was facilitated by the friendly recommendation of the pope to which we have already referred although galileo had made a narrow escape from the grasp of the inquisition yet he was never sufficiently sensible to the lenity which he experienced when he left rome in sixteen sixteen under the solemn pledge of never again teaching the obnoxious doctrine it was with hostility against the church suppressed by deeply cherished and his resolution to propagate the heresy seems to have been coeval with the woe by which he renounced it in the year sixteen eighteen when he communicated his theory of the tides to archduke leopold he alludes in the most sarcastic manner to the conduct of the church the same hostile tone more or less pervaded all his writings and while he laboured to sharpen the edge of his satire he endeavoured to guard himself against its effects by an affectation of the humblest deference to the decisions of theology had galileo stood alone his devotion to science might have withdrawn from so hopeless a contest but he was spurred on by the violence of a party the lynchian academy never scrupled to summon him from his researches they placed him in the forlorn hope of their combat and he at last fell a victim to the rashness of his friends but whatever allowance we may make for the ardour of galileo's temper and the peculiarity of his position and however we may justify and even approve of his past conduct his visit to urban aid in sixteen twenty four placed him in a new relation to the church which demanded on his part a new and corresponding demeanour the noble and generous reception which he met with from urban and the liberal declaration of the cardinal hohenstroller on the subject of copernican system should have been regarded as expressions of regret for the past and offers of consolation for the future thus honoured by the head of the church and befriended by its dignitaries galileo must have felt himself secure against the indignities of its lesser functionaries and possession of the fullest license to prosecute his researches and publish his discoveries provided he avoided the dogma of the church which even in the present day it has not ventured to renounce but galileo was born to the romish hierarchy by even stronger ties his son and himself were pensioners of the church and having accepted of its arms they owed to it a decent and respectful allegiance the pension thus given by the urban was not a remuneration with sovereigns sometimes awarded to the services of their subjects galileo was a foreigner at rome the sovereign of the papal trade owed him no obligation 
and hence he must regard the pension of galileo as a donation from the roman pontiff to science itself and as a declaration to the christian world that the religion was not jealous of philosophy and that the church of rome was willing to respect and foster even the genius of its enemies galileo viewed all these circumstances in a different light he resolved to compose a work in which the copernican system should be demonstrated but he had not the courage to do this in a direct and open manner he adopted a plan of discussing the subject in a dialogue between three speakers in the hope of eluding by his artifice the censure of the church this work was completed in sixteen thirty but owing to some difficulties in obtaining a license to print it it was not published till sixteen thirty two in obtaining the license galileo exhibited considerable address and his memory has not escaped from the imputation of having acted unfairly and of having involved his personal friends in the consequence of his imprudence the situation of master of the palace was unfortunately for galileo's designs filled with niccolo riccardi a friend and pupil of his own the officer was a sort of censor of a new publications and when he was applied to an subject of printing his work galileo soon found out that attempts had previously been made to thwart his views he instinctively set off for rome and had an interview with his friend who was in every respect anxious to oblige him riccardi examined the manuscript pointed out some incautious expressions which he considered it necessary to erase and returned it with the written approbation on the understanding that alterations he suggested would be made dreading to remain in rome during the unhealthy season which was fast approaching galileo returned to florence with the intention of completing the index and dedication and of sending the manuscripts to rome to be printed under the care of princessi the death of that distinguished individual in the august sixteen thirty frustrated galileo's plan and he applied for leave to have the book printed in florence riccardi at first desirous to examine the manuscript again but after inspecting only the beginning and the end of it he gave galileo leave to print it wherever he chose providing it bore the license of the inquisitor-general of florence and one or two other persons whom he named having overcome all these difficulties galileo's work was published in sixteen thirty two under the title of the system of the world of galileo galilei etc in which in four dialogues concerning the two principal systems of the world the ptolemaic and the copernican he discusses indeterminately and firmly the arguments proposed on both sides it is dedicated to ferdinand grand duke of tuscany and is prefaced by an address to the prudent reader which is itself characterized by the utmost imprudence he refers to the decree of the inquisition in the most insulting and ironical language he attributes it to passion and to ignorance not by direct assertion but by insinuations ascribed to others and he announces his intention to defend the copernican system as a pure mathematical hypothesis and not as an opinion having an advantage over that of the stability of the earth absolutely the dialogue is conducted by three persons salviati sagredo and simplicio salviati who is the true philosopher in the dialogue has the real name of a nobleman whom we have already had the occasion to mention sagredo the name of another noble friend of galileo's performs a secondary part under salviati he proposes doubts suggests difficulties and enlivens the gravity of the dialogue with his wit and pleasantry simplicio is a resolute follower of ptolemy and aristotle and with a proper degree of candour and modesty he brings forward all the common arguments in favour of the ptolemaic system between the wit of sagredo and the powerful philosophy of salviati the peripatetic stage is baffled in every discussion and there can be no doubt that galileo aimed a more fatal blow at the ptolemaic system by this mode of discussing it than if he had endeavoured to overturn it by direct arguments the influence of this work on the public mind was such as might have been anticipated the obnoxious doctrines which it upheld were eagerly received and widely disseminated and the church of rome became sensible of the shock which has thus given to the intellectual supremacy pope urban eight attached though he had been to galileo never once hesitated respecting the line of conduct 
which he felt himself bound to pursue his mind was nevertheless agitated with conflicting sentiments he entertained a sincere affection for science and literature and yet he was placed in the position of their enemy he had been the personal friend of galileo and yet his duty compelled him to become his accuser embarrassing as these feelings were other considerations contributed to soothe him he had in his capacity of a cardinal opposed to the first persecution of galileo he had since his elevation to the pontificate traced an open path for the march of galileo's discoveries and he had finally endeavoured to bind the recusant philosopher by the chains of kindness and gratitude all these means however had proved abortive and he was now called upon the support of doctrine which he had subscribed and administered the law of which he was the guardian it has been supposed without any satisfactory evidence that urban may have been influenced by less creditable motives salviati and sagredo being well-known personages it was inferred that simplicio must have a representative the enemies of galileo are said to have convinced his holiness that simplicio was intended as a portrait of himself and this opinion received some probability from the fact that the peripatetic disputant had employed many of the arguments which urban had himself used in his discussions with galileo the latest biographer of galileo regards this motive as a necessary to account for the otherwise inexplicable change which took place in the conduct of urban to his old friend but we cannot admit the truth of this supposition the church had been placed in hostility to a powerful and liberal party which was adverse to its interests the dogmas of the catholic faith had been brought into direct collision with the deductions of science the leader of philosophic band had broken the most solemn armistice with the inquisition he had renounced the ties of gratitude which bound himself to the pontiff and urban was thus compelled to entrench himself in a position to which he had been driven by his opponents the design of summoning galileo before the inquisition seems to have been formed almost immediately after the publication of his book for even in the august sixteen thirty two the preliminary proceedings had reached the ears of the grand duke ferdinand the tuscan ambassador at rome was speedily acquainted with the dissatisfaction which his sovereign felt at these proceedings and he was instructed to forward to florence a written statement of the charges against galileo in order to enable him to prepare for his defence although this request was denied ferdinand again interposed and transmitted a letter to his ambassador recommending the admission of campanella and castelli into the congregation of the ecclesiastics by whom galileo was to be judged circumstances however rendered it prudent to withhold this letter castelli was sent away from rome and scipio ciramonte a bigoted ecclesiastic was summoned from pisa to complete the number of judges it appears from a despatch of the tuscan minister that ferdinand was enraged at the transaction and he instructed his ambassador nicolini to make the strongest representations to the pope nicolini had several interviews with his holiness but all those expostulations were fruitless he found urban highly incensed against galileo and his holiness begged nicolini to advise the archduke not to interfere any further as he would not get through it with the honour on the fifteenth of september the pope caused it to be intimated to nicolini as a mark of a special esteem for the grand duke that he was obliged to refer the work to the inquisition but both the prince and his ambassador were declared liable to the usual censures if they divulged the secret from the measures which the tribunal had formerly pursued it was not difficult to foresee the result of their present deliberations they summoned galileo to appear before them at rome to answer in person the charges under which he lay the tuscan ambassador expostulated warmly with the court of rome on the inhumanity of his proceedings he urged his advanced age his infirm health the discomforts of the journey and the miseries of the quarantine as the motives for reconsidering their decision but the pope was inexorable and though it was agreed to relax the quarantine as much as possible in his favour yet it was declared indispensable that he should appear in person before the inquisition worn out with age and infirmities and exhausted with fatigues of his journey 
galileo arrived at rome on the fourteenth of february sixteen thirty three the tuscan ambassador announced his arrival in an official form to the commissary of the holy office and galileo awaited in calm dignity the approach of his trial among those who preferred their advice in this distressing emergency we must enumerate the cardinal barbarino the pope's nephew who though he may have felt the necessity of an interference on the part of the church was yet desirous that it should be effected with the least injury to galileo and to science he accordingly visited galileo and advised him to remain as much at home as possible to keep aloof from the general society and to see only his most intimate friends the same advice was given from four different quarters and galileo feeling its propriety remained in strict seclusion in the palace of the tuscan ambassador during the whole trial which had now commenced galileo was treated with most marked indulgence abhorring as we must do the principles and practices of this odious tribunal and reprobating its interference with the cautious deductions of science we must yet admit that on this occasion its deliberations were not dictated by passion nor its power directed by vengeance though placed at their judgment seat as a heretic galileo stood there with the recognized attributes of a sage and though an offender against laws of which they were the guardian yet the highest respect was yielded to his genius and the kindest commiseration to his infirmities in the beginning of april when his examination in person was to commence it became necessary that he should be removed to the holy office but instead of committing him as was the practice to solitary confinement he was provided with apartments in the house of the fiscal of the inquisition his table was provided by the tuscan ambassador and a servant was allowed to attend him at his pleasure and to sleep in an adjoining apartment even this nominal confinement however galileo's high spirit was unable to brook an attack of the disease to which he was constitutionally subject contributed to fret and irritate him and he became impatient for a release from his anxiety as well as from his bondage cardinal barbarino seems to have received notice of the state of galileo's feelings and with magnanimity which posterity will ever honour he liberated the philosopher on his own responsibility and in ten days after his first examination and on the last day of april he was restored to the hospitable roof of the tuscan ambassador though this favour was granted on the condition of his remaining in strict seclusion galileo recovered his health and to a certain degree his usual hilarity amid the kind of intentions of nicolini and his family and when the want of exercise had begun to produce symptoms of indisposition the tuscan minister obtained for him leave to go into public gardens in a half-closed carriage after the inquisition had examined galileo personally they allowed him a reasonable time for preparing his defence he felt the difficulty of adducing anything like a plausible justification of his conduct and he resorted to an ingenious though a shallow artifice which was regarded by the court as an aggravation of the crime after his first appearance before the inquisition in sixteen sixteen he was publicly and falsely charged by his enemies with having then abjured his opinions and he was taunted as a criminal who had been actually punished for his offences as a refutation to these calumnies cardinal bellarmine had given him a certificate in his own handwriting declaring that he neither abjured his opinions nor suffered punishment for them and that the doctrine of the earth's motion and the sun's stability was only denounced to him as contrary to scripture and as one which could not be defended to this certificate the cardinal did not add because he was not called upon to do it that galileo was enjoined not to teach in any manner the doctrine thus denounced and galileo ingeniously avails himself of this supposed omission to account for his having in the lapse of fourteen or sixteen years forgotten the injunction he assigned the same excuse for his having omitted mention this injunction to ricardi and to the inquisitor general at florence when he obtained the license to print his dialogues the court held the production of the certificate to be at once as a proof and aggravation of his offence because the certificate itself declared that obnoxious doctrines had been pronounced contrary to the holy scriptures 
having duly waived the confessions and excuses of their prisoner and considered general merits for the case the inquisition came to an agreement upon the sentence which they were to pronounce and appointed the twenty second of june as the day on which it was to be delivered two days previous to this galileo was summoned to appear at the holy office and on the morning of the twenty first he obeyed the summons on the twenty second of june he was clothed in penitential dress and conducted to the convent of minerva where the inquisition was assembled to give judgment a long and elaborate sentence was pronounced detailing the former proceedings of the inquisition and specifying the offences which he had committed in teaching heretical doctrines in violating his former pledges and in obtaining by improper means the license for printing of his dialogues after an invocation of the name of our saviour and of the holy virgin galileo was declared to have brought himself under strong suspicions of heresy and to have incurred all the censures and penalties which were enjoined against delinquents of this kind but from all these consequences he is to be held absolved provided that with a sincere heart and with a faithful unfeigned he abjures and curses the heresies he has cherished as well as every other heresy against the catholic church in order that his offence might not go altogether unpunished that he might be more cautious in future and be a warning to others to abstain from similar delinquencies it was also decreed that his dialogues should be prohibited by public edict that he himself should be condemned to prison of the inquisition during their pleasure and that in the course of the next three years he should recite once a week the seven penitential psalms the ceremony of galileo's abjuration was one of exciting interest and of awful formality clothed in the sackcloth of a repentant criminal the venerable sage fell upon his knees before the assembled cardinals and laying his hands upon the holy evangelists he invoked the divine aid in abjuring and detesting and owing never to again teach the doctrines of the earth's motion and of the sun's stability he pledged himself that he would never again either in words or in writing propagate such heresies and he swore that he would fulfil and observe the penances which had been inflicted upon him at the conclusion of this ceremony in which he recited his abjuration word for word and then signed it he was conveyed in conformity with his sentence to the prison of the inquisition the account which we have now given of the trial and the sentence of galileo is pregnant with the deepest interest and intrusion human nature is here drawn in its darkest colouring and in surveying the melancholy picture it is difficult to decide whether religion or philosophy has been most degraded while we witness the presumptuous priest pronouncing infallible the decrees of his own erring judgment we see the high-minded philosopher abjuring the eternal and immutable truths which he had himself the glory of establishing in the ignorance and prejudices of the age in a too literal interpretation of the language of scripture in a mistaken respect of the errors that he had become venerable from their antiquity and in the peculiar position which galileo had taken among the avowed enemies of the church we may find the elements of an apology poor though it be for the conduct of the inquisition but what excuse can be devised for the humiliating confession and abjuration of galileo why did this master spirit of age the high priest of the stars the representative of the signs this hoary sage whose career of glory was near its consummation why did he reject the crown of the martyrdom which he had himself coveted and which plated with immortal laurels was about to descend upon his head if in place of disavowing the laws of nature and surrendering in his own person the intellectual dignity of his species he had boldly asserted the truth of his opinions and confided his character to posterity and his cause to an all-ruling providence he would have strung up the hair suspended sabre and disarmed for ever the hostility which threatened to overwhelm him the philosopher however was supported only by philosophy and in the love of truth he found a miserable substitute for the hopes of the martyr galileo covered under the fear of a man and his submission was the salvation of the church 
the sword of inquisition descended on his prostrate neck and though its stroke was not physical yet it fell with moral influence fatal to the character of its victim and to the dignity of science in studying with attention this portion of scientific history the reader will not fail to perceive that the church of rome was driven into dilemma from which the submission and abjuration of galileo could alone extricate it he who confesses a crime and denounces its atrocity not only sanctions but inflicts the punishment which is annexed to it but galileo declared his innocence and avowed his sentiments and had he appealed to the past conduct of the church itself to the acknowledged opinions of its dignitaries and even to the acts of its pontiffs he would have at once confounded his accusers and escaped from their toils after copernicus himself a catholic priest had openly maintained the motion of the earth and the stability of the sun after he had dedicated the work which advocated these opinions to the pope paul iii on the express ground that the authority of the pontiff might silence the calumnies of those who attacked these opinions by arguments drawn from the scripture after the cardinal of schoenberg and the bishop of culm had urged copernicus to publish the new doctrines and after the bishop of ermeland had erected a monument to commemorate his great discoveries how could the church of rome have appealed to its pontifical decrees as the ground of persecuting and punishing galileo even in later times the same doctrines have been propagated with entire toleration nay in the very year of galileo's first persecution paul anthony foscarinus a learned carmelite monk wrote a pamphlet in which he illustrates and defends the mobility of the earth and endeavours to reconcile this new doctrine the passage of the scripture which he had employed to subvert it this very singular production was dated from the carmelite convent at naples was dedicated to the very reverend sebastian pantoni general of the carmelite order and sanctioned by the ecclesiastical authorities it was published at naples in sixteen fifteen the very year of the first persecution of galileo nor was this the only defence of the copernican system which issued from the bosom of the church thomas campanella a calabrian monk published in sixteen twenty two an apology for galileo and he even dedicates it to d boniface cardinal of cacheta nay it appears from the dedication that he undertook the work at the command of the cardinal and that the examination of the question had been entrusted to the cardinal by the holy senate after an able defence of his friend campanella refers at the conclusion of his apology to the suppression of galileo's writings and justly observes that the effect of such a measure would be to make him more generally read and more highly esteemed the boldness of the apologist however is wisely tempered by the humility of the ecclesiastic and he concludes his work with declaration that in all his opinions whether written or to be written he submits himself to the opinions of the holy mother church of rome and to the judgment of his superiors by these proceedings of the dignitaries as well as the clergy of the church of rome which had been tolerated for more than a century the decrees of the pontiffs against the doctrine of the earth's motion were virtually appealed and galileo might have pleaded them with the success in arrest of judgment unfortunately however for himself and for the science he acted otherwise by admitting their authority he revived in fresh force these obsolete and obnoxious enactments and by yielding to their power he riveted for another century the almost broken chains of spiritual despotism it is a curious fact that in the annals of heresy and sedition that opinions maintained with impunity by one individual have in the same age brought others to the stake or to the scaffold the result of deep research or extravagant speculation seldom provoke hostility when meekly announced as the deductions of reason or the convictions of conscience as the dreams of a recluse or of an enthusiast they may excite pity or call forth contempt but like seed quietly cast into the earth they will rot and germinate according to the vitality with which they are endowed but if new and startling opinions are thrown in the face of the community if they are uttered in triumph or in insult in contempt of public opinion or in derision of cherished errors 
they lose the comeliness of the truth in the rancour of their propagation and they are like seeds scattered in the hurricane which only irritates and blinds the husbandman had galileo concluded his system of the world with a quiet peroration of his apologist campanella and dedicated it to the pope it might have stood in the library of the vatican beside the cherished though equally heretical volume of copernicus in the abjuration of his opinions by galileo pope urban seven did not fail to observe the full extent of his triumph and he exhibited the utmost sagacity in the means which he employed to secure it while he endeavoured to overawe the enemies of the church by the formal promulgation of galileo's sentence and abjuration and by punishing the officials who had assisted in obtaining the license to print his book he treated galileo with utmost lenity and yielded to every request that was made to diminish and almost suspend the constraint under which he lay the sentence of abjuration was ordered to be publicly read at several universities at florence the ceremonial was performed in the church of santa cross and the friends and disciples of galileo were especially summoned to witness the public degradation of their master the inquisitor at florence was ordered to be reprimanded for his conduct and riccardi the master of the sacred palace and Chiampali, the secretary of pope urban himself were dismissed from their situations galileo had remained only four days in the prison of the inquisition when on the application of nicolini the tuscan ambassador he was allowed to reside with him in his palace as florence still suffered under the contagious disease which we have already mentioned it was proposed that siena would be the place of galileo's confinement and that his residence should be in one of the convents of that city nicolini however recommended the palace of the archbishop piccolomoni as a more suitable residence and though the archbishop was one of galileo's best friends the pope agreed the arrangement and in the beginning of july galileo quitted rome for siena after having spent nearly six months under the hospitable roof of his friend and with no other restraint than that of being confined to the limits of the palace galileo was permitted to return to his villa near florence under the same restrictions and as the contagious disease had disappeared in tuscany he was able in the month of december to re-enter his own house at archetry where he spent the remainder of his days end of chapter five read by lambda chapter six of the martyrs of science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the martyrs of science by david brewster life of galileo chapter six galileo loses his favorite daughter he falls into a state of melancholy and ill health is allowed to go to florence for its recovery in sixteen thirty eight but is prevented from leaving his house or receiving his friends his friend castelli permitted to visit him in the presence of an officer of the inquisition he composes his celebrated dialogues on local motion discovers the moon's liberation loses the sight of one eye the other eye attacked by the same disease is struck blind negotiates with the dutch government respecting his method of finding the longitude he is allowed free intercourse with his friends his illness and death in sixteen forty two his epitaph his social moral and scientific character although galileo had now the happiness of rejoining his family under their paternal roof yet like all the sublunary blessings it was but of short duration his favourite daughter maria who along with her sister had joined the convent of st matthew in the neighbourhood of architry had looked forward to the arrival of her father with the most affectionate anticipations she hoped that her filial devotion might form some compensation for the malignity of his enemies and she eagerly assumed the labour of reciting weekly the seven pensionary psalms which formed part of her father's sentence these sacred duties however were destined to terminate almost at the moment they were begun 
she was seized with a fatal illness in the same month in which she rejoined her parent and before the month of april she was no more this heavy blow so suddenly struck overwhelmed galileo in the deepest agony owing to the decline of his health and the recurrence of his old complaints he was unable to oppose to this mental suffering the constitutional energy of his mind the bulwarks of his heart broke down and a flood of grief desolated his manly and powerful mind he felt as he expressed it that he was incessantly called by his daughter his impulse intermitted his heart was agitated by unceasing palpitations his appetite entirely left him and he considered his dissolution so near at hand that he would not permit his son vincenzo to set upon a journey which he had contemplated from this state of melancholy and indisposition galileo slowly though partially recovered and with the view of obtaining medical assistance he requested leave to go to florence his enemies however refused this application and he was given to understand that any additional importunities would be visited with a more vigilant surveillance he remained therefore five years at architri from sixteen thirty four to sixteen thirty eight without any remission of his confinement and pursuing his studies under the influence of continued and general indisposition there is no reason to think that galileo or his friends renewed their application to the church of rome but in sixteen thirty eight the pope transmitted through the inquisitor farino his permission that that he might remove to florence for the recovery of his health on the condition that he should present himself at the office of the inquisitor to learn the terms upon which this indulgence was granted galileo accepted of the kindness thus unexpectedly proffered but the condition upon which it was given were more severe than he expected he was prohibited from leaving his house or admitting his friends and so sternly was the system pursued that he required a special order for attending mass during passion week the severity of this order was keenly felt by galileo while he reminded architri his seclusion from the world would have been an object of choice if it had not been the decree of the tribunal but to be debarred from the conversation of his friends in florence in that city where his genius had been idolized and where his fame had been immortal was an aggravation of punishment which he was unable to bear with his accustomed kindness the grand duke made a strong representation on the subject of his ambassador at the court of rome he stated from his great age and infirmities galileo's career was near its close that he possessed many valuable ideas which the world might lose if they are not matured and conveyed to his friends and that galileo was anxious to make these communications to father castelli who was then a stipendary at the court of rome the grand duke commanded his ambassador to see castelli on the subject to urge him to obtain a leave from the pope to spend a few weeks in florence and to supply him with money and everything that was necessary for his journey influenced by this kind and liberal message castelli obtained the audience of the pope and requested leave to pay a visit to florence urban instantly suspected the object of his journey and upon castelli's acknowledging that he could not possibly refrain from seeing galileo he received permission to visit him in the company of an officer of the inquisition castelli accordingly went to florence and a few months afterwards galileo was ordered to return to architri during galileo's confinement at siena and architri between sixteen thirty three and sixteen thirty eight his time was principally occupied in the composition of his dialogues on local motion in which he treats of the strength and cohesion of the solid bodies of the laws of uniform and accelerated motions of the motion of projectiles and of the centre of gravity of solids this remarkable work which was considered by its author as the best of its productions was printed by louis elsewhere at amsterdam and dedicated to the count de noelles the french ambassador at rome various attempts to have it printed in germany had failed and in order to save himself from the malignity of his enemies he was obliged to pretend that the edition published in holland had been printed from a manuscript entrusted to the french ambassador although galileo had for a long time abandoned his astronomical studies yet his attention was directed about the year sixteen thirty six to a curious appearance on the lunar disk which is known by the name of the moon's liberation when we examine with the telescope the outline of the moon we observe that certain parts of her disk which are seen at a time are invisible at another 
this change or liberation is of four different kinds like the diurnal liberation the liberation in longitude the liberation in latitude and the spheroidal liberation galileo discovered the first of these kinds of liberation and appears to have had some knowledge of the second but the third was discovered by hevelius and the fourth by lagrange the curious discovery was the result of the last telescopic observation of galileo although his right eye had for some years lost its power yet his general vision was sufficiently perfect to enable him to carry on his usual researches in sixteen thirty six however this affection of his eye became more serious and in sixteen thirty seven his left eye was attacked with the same disease his medical friends at first supposed the cataracts were formed in the crystalline lens and anticipated a cure from the operation of coaching these hopes were fallacious the disease turned out to be in the cornea and every attempt to restore its transparency was fruitless in a few months the white cloud covered the whole aperture of the pupil and galileo became totally blind this sudden and unexpected calamity had almost overwhelmed galileo and his friends in writing to a correspondent he exclaims alas your dear friend and servant has become totally and irreparably blind these heavens this earth this universe which by wonderful observations i had enlarged a thousand times beyond the belief of past ages are henceforth shrunk into a narrow space which i myself occupy so it pleases god it shall therefore please me also his friend father castelli deplores the calamity in the same tone of pathetic sublimity the noblest eye says he which nature ever made is darkened an eye so privileged and gifted with such rare powers that it might truly be said to have seen more than the eyes of all that are gone and to have opened the eyes of all that are to come although galileo had been thwarted in his attempt to introduce into the spanish marine his new method of finding the longitude at sea yet he never lost sight of an object to which he attached the highest importance as the formation of the correct tables of the motion of jupiter's satellites was a necessary preliminary to this introduction he had occupied himself for twenty-four years in observation for this purpose and he had made considerable progress in this laborious task after the publication of his dialogues on motion in sixteen thirty six he renewed his attempts to bring his method into actual use for this purpose he addressed himself to lorenzo real who had been a dutch governor-general in india and offered the free use of his method to the states general of holland the dutch government received this proposal with an anxious desire to have it carried into effect at instigation of constantin huygens the father of the illustrious huygens and the secretary of the prince of orange they appointed commissioners to communicate with galileo and while they transmitted him a golden chain as a mark of their esteem they at the same time assured him that if his plan should prove successful it should not pass unrewarded the commissioners entered into an active correspondence with galileo and had been appointed one of their number to communicate personally with him in italy lest this however should excite the jealousy of the court of rome galileo objected to the arrangement so that the negotiation was carried on solely by correspondence it was at this time that galileo was struck with blindness his friend and pupil renery undertook in this emergency to arrange and complete his observation and calculations but before he had made much progress in this arduous task each of the four commissioners died in succession and it was with great difficulty that constant and huygens succeeded in renewing the scheme it was again obstructed however by the death of galileo and when renery was about to publish by the order of grand duke the ephemeris and the tables of the jovian planets he was attacked with a mortal disease and the manuscripts of galileo which he was on the eve of publishing were never more heard of by such a series of misfortunes were the plans of galileo and the of the states general completely overthrown it is some consolation however to know that neither science nor navigation suffered any severe loss notwithstanding the perfection of our present tables of the jupiter satellites and of the astronomical instruments by which their eclipses have been observed the method of galileo is still impracticable at sea in consequence of strict seclusion to which galileo had been subjected he was in practice of dating his letters from his prison of arcetri but after he had lost use of his eyes 
the inquisition seems to have relaxed its severity and to have allowed him the freest intercourse with his friends the grand duke of tuscany paid him frequent visits and among the celebrated strangers who came to the distant lands to see the ornament of italy were cassandi diodati and our illustrious countryman milton during the last three years of his life his eminent pupil vivani formed one of his family and in october sixteen forty one the celebrated torricelli another of his pupils was admitted to the same distinction though the powerful mind of galileo still retained its vigour yet his debilitated frame was exhausted with mental labour he often complained that his head was too busy for his body and the continuity of his studies was broken down with attacks of hypochondria want of sleep and acute rheumatic pains along with these calamities he was afflicted with another still more severe with deafness almost total but though he was not excluded from all communication with the external world yet his mind still grappled with material universe and while he was studying the force of percussion and preparing for a continuation of his dialogues on motion he was attacked with fever and palpitation of the heart which after continuing two months terminated fatally on the eighth of january sixteen forty two in seventy eighth year of his age having died in the character of a prisoner of the inquisition his odious tribunal disputed his right of making a will and of being buried in consecrated ground these objections however were withdrawn but though a large sum was subscribed for erecting a monument to him in the church of santa Croce in florence the pope would not permit the design to be carried out into execution his sacred remains were therefore deposited in an obscure corner of the church and remained for more than thirty years unmarked with any monument tablet the following epitaph given without any remark by leyden edition of his dialogues is we presume the one which was inscribed on a tablet in the church of santa Croce. galileo galilei florentino philosopho e geometrere verilincio nascere odipo mirabilium semper inventora machinatori qui in cosessa aduc mortalibus gloria celorum provincia soxit e universo dedit incrementum non enim veteros perherum orbes fragilisc stellas conflavit sed aterna mundi corpore medicie beneficie dedicavit cujus inextincta gloriae cupidatas ut oclos nascinum seclarum quo ominum videre doceret propirios impendit oculos cum jam nil amplius haberet natura quod ipse videret cujus inventa vix intraredam limites comprehensa firmamentum ipsum son solum continent sed etiam recipit qui relistis tot sinuarium monumentis plura secum tulit quam reliquit gravi enim sed non dum affecta sentuet novus contemplationibus majorum gloriam affectans inexplibilum sapiente animum immatura nobis obitu hex salavit anno domini m c x l e e adheda sue l x x v e e e at his death in seventeen o three viviani purchased his property with the charge of erecting a monument over galileo's remains and his own the design was carried out into effect in seventeen thirty seven at the expense of the family of nelly when both their bodies were disinterred and removed to the site of splendid monument which now covers them this monument contains the bust of galileo with figures of geometry and astronomy it was designed by Guido Foggini. Galileo's bust was executed by Giovanni Battista Foggini. The figure of astronomy by Vincenzo Foggini, his son, and that of geometry by Girolamo Ticciati. Galileo's house at Architri still remains. In 1821, it belonged to one Signor Alimari. Having been preserved in the state in which it was left by Galileo, it stands very near the convent of St. Matthew and about a mile 
to the southeast of florence an inscription by nelly over the door of the house still remains the character of galileo whether we view him as a member of the social circle or as a man of science presents many interesting and instructive points of contemplation unfortunate and to certain extent immoral in his domestic relations he did not derive from that hallowed source all the enjoyments which it generally yields and it was owing to this cause perhaps that he was more fond of society than might have been expected from his studious habits his habitual cheerfulness and gaiety and his affability and frankness of manner rendered him an universal favourite among his friends without any of the pedantry of the exclusive talent and without any of ostentation which often marks the man of limited though profound acquirements galileo never conversed upon scientific or philosophical subjects except among those who were capable of understanding them the extent of his general information indeed his great literary knowledge but above all his return to memory stored with the legends and the poetry of ancient times saved him from the necessity of drawing upon his own peculiar studies for the topics of his conversation galileo was not less distinguished for his hospitality and benevolence he was liberal to the poor and generous in aid which he administered to men of genius and talent who often found a comfortable asylum under his roof in his domestic economy he was frugal without being parsimonious his hospitable board was ever ready for the reception of his friends and though he was himself abstemious in his diet he seems to have been a lover of good wines of which he received always the choicest varieties out of the grand duke's cellar this peculiar taste together with his attachment to a country life rendered him fond of agricultural pursuits and induced him to devote his leisure hours to the cultivation of his vineyards in his personal appearance galileo was about the middle size and of square build but well proportioned frame his complexion was fair his eyes penetrating and his hair was reddish hue his expression was cheerful and animated and though his temper was easily ruffled yet the excitement was transient and the cause of it speedily forgotten one of the most prominent traits in the character of galileo was his invincible love of the truth and his abhorrence of the spiritual despotism which had long been brooded over europe his views however were too liberal and too far in advance of the age which he adorned and however much we may admire the noble spirit which he evinced and the personal sacrifices which he made in his struggle for truth we must yet lament the hotness of his zeal and the temerity of his onset in his conquest with the church of rome he fell under her victorious banner and though his cause was of that of truth and hers that of superstition yet the sympathy of europe was not roused by his misfortunes under the sagacious and the peaceful sway of copernicus astronomy had effected a glorious triumph over the dogmas of church but under the bold and uncompromising sceptre of galileo all her conquests were irrecoverably lost the scientific character of galileo and his method of investigating truth demand our warmest admiration the number and ingenuity of his inventions the brilliant discoveries which he made in the heavens and the deep and beauty of his researches respecting the laws of motion have gained him admiration of every succeeding age and have placed him next to newton in the list of original and inventive genius to this high rank he was doubtless elevated by inductive process which he followed in all his inquiries under the sure guidance of observation and experiment he advanced to general laws and if bacon had never lived the student of nature would have found in writings and labors of galileo not only the boasted principles of the inductive philosophy but also their practical applications to the highest efforts of invention and discovery end of chapter 6 read by lambda chapter 7 of the martyrs of science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the martyrs of science by david brewster life of tycho brahe chapter 1 tycho's birth family and education 
an eclipse of the sun turns his attention to astronomy studies law at leipzig but pursues astronomy by stealth his uncle's death he returns to copenhagen and resumes his observations revisits germany fights a duel and loses his nose visits augsburg and meets heinzel who assists him in making large quadrant revisits denmark and is warmly received by the king he settles at his uncle's castle in herzfold his observatory and laboratory discovers the new star in cassiopeia account of this remarkable body tycho's marriage with a peasant girl which irritates his friends his lectures on astronomy he visits the prince of hesse attends the coronation of the emperor rudolph at ratisbon he returns to denmark among the distinguished men who were destined to revive the sciences and to establish the true system of the universe tycho brahe holds a conspicuous place he was born on the 14th december 1546 at knudstorp the estate of his ancestors which is situated near helsingborg in scania and was the eldest son and the second child of a family of five sons and five daughters his father otto brahe who was descended from a noble swedish family was in such straitened circumstances that he resolves to educate his sons for the military profession but tycho seems to have disliked the choice that was made for him and his next brother steno who appears to have had similar feeling exchanges sport for a more peaceful occupation of privy councillor to the king the rest of his brothers though of senatorial rank do not seem to have extended the renown of their family but their younger sister sophia is represented as an accomplished mathematician and is said to have devoted her mind to astronomy as well as to astrological reveries of the age george bra the brother of otto having no children of his own resolved to adopt and educate one of his nephews on the birth of tycho accordingly he was desirous of having him placed under his wife's care but his parents could not be prevailed upon to part with their child till after the birth of steno their second son having then instructed in reading and writing under proper masters tycho began to study latin in his seventh year and in opposition to his father's views he prosecuted it for five years under private teachers from whom he received also occasional instruction in poetry and the belles lettres in april 1559 about three years after his father's death tycho was sent to university of copenhagen to study rhetoric and philosophy with the view of preparing for the study of law and qualifying himself for some of those political offices which his rank entitled him to expect in this situation he contracted no fondness for any particular study but after he had been sixteen months at college an event occurred which directed all the powers of his mind to the science of astronomy the attention of the public had been long fixed on a great eclipse of the sun which was to happen on the twenty first of august fifteen sixty and in those days a phenomenon of this kind was linked with destinies of the nation as well as of individuals the interest which it excited was as intense as it is general tycho watched its arrival with peculiar anxiety he read the astrological diaries of the day in which its phases and its consequences were described and when he saw the sun darkened at the very moment that it had been predicted and to the very extent that it had been delineated he resolved to make himself master of a science which was capable of predicting future events and especially that branch of it which connected these events with the fortunes and destinies of man with this view he purchased the tabulae virginis calculated by john stadius and began with ardour the study of the planetary motions when tycho had completed his course at copenhagen he was sent in february fifteen sixty two under the charge of a tutor to study jurisprudence at leswick astronomy however engrossed all his thoughts and he had no sooner escaped from the daily surveillance of his master than he rushed with headlong impetuosity into his favourite pursuits with his pocket money he purchased astronomical books which he read in secret and by means of a celestial globe the size of his fist he made himself acquainted with stars 
and followed them night after night through the heavens when sleep had lulled the vigilance of his preceptor by means of ephemerides of stadius he learned to distinguish the planets and to trace them through their direct and retrograde movements and having obtained the alphosin and protonic tables and compared his calculations and observations with those of stadius he observed great difference in the results and from that moment he seems to have conceived the design of devoting his life to the accurate construction of tables which he justly regarded as the basis of astronomy with this view he applied himself secretly to the study of arithmetic and geometry and without the assistance of a master he acquired that mathematical knowledge which enabled him to realize these early aspirations his ardor for astronomy was still farther inflamed and the resolution which it inspired still farther strengthened by the great conjunction of jupiter and saturn which took place in august fifteen sixty three the calculated time of this phenomenon differed considerably from the true time which was observed and in determining the instant of conjunction tycho felt in the strongest manner the imperfection of these instruments which he used for this purpose he employed a sort of compass one leg of which was directed to one planet and the second to the other planet or fixed star and by measuring the angular opening between them he determined the distance of the two celestial bodies by this rude contrivance he found that alphonse in tables erred a whole month in the time of conjunction while the copernican ones were at least several days in error to this celebrated conjunction tycho ascribed the great plague which in subsequent years desolated europe because it took place in the beginning of leo and not far from the nebulous stars of cancer two of the zodiacal signs which are reckoned by ptolemy suffocating and pestilent there dwelt at this time at leipzig an ingenious artisan named sculptetus who was employed by homilius the professor of mathematics in that city to assist him in the construction of his instruments having become acquainted with this young man tycho put into his hand a wooden radius such as was recommended by gem of Rhesus, for the purpose of having it divided in the manner adopted by homilius and with this improved instrument he made a great number of astronomical observations out of his window without ever exciting the suspicions of his tutor having spent three years at leipzig he was about to make the tour of germany when in the consequence of his uncle's death he was summoned to his native country to inherit the fortune which had been left him he accordingly quitted leipzig about the middle of may fifteen sixty five and having arranged his domestic concerns in denmark he continued his astronomical observations with the radius constructed for him by sculptetus the ardour with which he pursued his studies gave great umbrage to his friends as well as to his relations he was reproached for having abandoned the profession of the law these astronomical observations were ridiculed as not only useless but degrading and among his numerous connections his maternal uncle stenobile was the only one who applauded him for following the bent of his genius under these uncomfortable circumstances he resolved to quit his country and pay a visit to the most interesting cities of germany at Wittenberg, where he arrived in april fifteen sixty six he resumed his astronomical observations but in consequence of the plague having broken out in that city he removed to rostock in the following autumn where an accident occurred which had nearly deprived him of his life on the tenth of december he was invited to a wedding feast and among other guests there was present a noble countryman of his own manderupius Pasarbegius. some difference having arisen between them on this occasion they parted with feelings of mutual displeasure on the twenty seventh of the same month they met again at some festive games and having revived their former quarrel they agreed to settle their differences by the sword they accordingly met at seven o'clock in the evening of the twenty ninth and fought in total darkness in this blind combat mandarupius cut off the whole of the front of tycho's nose and it was fortunate for astronomy that his more valuable organs were defended by so faithful an outpost the quarrel which was said to have originated in the difference of opinion respecting their mathematical acquirements terminated here and tycho repaired his loss by cementing upon his face a nose of gold and silver 
which is said to have formed a good imitation of the original during the years of fifteen sixty seven and fifteen sixty eight tycho continued to reside at rostock with the exception of a few months during which he made a rapid journey into denmark he lived in a house in the college of the jesuits which he had rented on the account of its fitness for celestial observations but though he intended to spend the winter under its roof he had made no arrangement respecting his future life leaving it as he said in the hands of the providence a desire however to visit the south of germany induced him to quit rostock and having crossed danube he paid a visit to augsburg upon entering the ancient city tycho was particularly struck with the grandeur of its fortifications the splendour of its private houses and the beauty of its fountains and after a short residence within its walls he was still more delighted with the industry of the people the refinement of the higher classes and the love of literature and science which was cherished by its wealthy citizens among the interesting acquaintances which he formed at augsburg were two brothers john and paul heinzel the one a september and the other a consul or bourgeois master they were both distinguished by their learning and both of them particularly paul were ardent lovers of astronomy tycho had hitherto no other astronomical instrument than the coarse radius which was made for him by sculptors and he waited only for a proper occasion to have a larger and better instrument constructed for his use having now the command of workmen who could execute his plans he conceived the bold design of making a divided instrument which should distinctly exhibit single minutes of a degree while he was transferring the first rude conception of his instrument to paper paul heinzel entered his study and was so struck with the grandeur of the plan that he instantly undertook to have it executed at his own expense the projected instrument was a quadrant of fourteen cubits radius and tycho and his friend entered upon its construction with that intense ardour which is ever crowned with success in the village of jejinga about a mile to the south of the city paul heinzel had a country house the garden of which was chosen as the spot where the quadrant was to be fixed the best artists in augsburg clockmakers dwellers smiths and carpenters were engaged to execute the work and from the zeal which so novel an instrument inspired the quadrant was completed in less than a month its size was so great that twenty men could with difficulty transport it to its place of fixture the two principal rectangular radii were beams of oak the arch which lay between the extremities was made of solid wood of a particular kind and the whole was bound together by twelve beams it received additional strength from several iron bands and the arch was covered with plates of brass for the purpose of receiving the five thousand four hundred divisions into which it was to be subdivided a large and a strong pillar of oak shod with iron was driven into the ground and kept in its place by solid mason work to this pillar the quadrant was fixed in a vertical plane and the steps were prepared to elevate the observer when the stars of low altitude required his attention as the instrument could not be conveniently covered with the roof it was protected from weather by a covering made of skins but notwithstanding this and other precautions it was broken to pieces by a violent storm after having remained uninjured for a space of five years as this quadrant was fitted only to determine the altitudes of the celestial bodies tycho constructed a large sextant for the purpose of measuring their distances it consisted of two radii which opened and shut round the centre and which was nearly four cubits long and also two arches one of which was graduated while the other served to keep the radii in the same place after the radii had been opened or shut till they nearly comprehended the angle between the stars to be observed the adjustment was completed by means of a very fine tangent screw with this instrument tycho made many excellent observations during his stay at augsburg he began also construction of a wooden globe about six feet in diameter its outer surface was turned with great accuracy into spear and kept from warping by interior bars of wood supported at its centre after receiving a visit from the celebrated peter ramus who subsequently fell a victim at the massacre of st Bartholomew, tycho left augsburg having received a promise from his friend heinzel that he would communicate to him the observations made with this large quadrant and with the sextant which he had given him in a present 
he paid a visit to philip appian in passing through ingolstadt and returned to his native country about the end of fifteen seventy one the fame which he had acquired as an astronomer procured for him a warmer reception than that which he had formerly experienced the king invited him to court and his friends and admirers loaded him with kindness his uncle stenobile who now lived at the ancient town of heritswold and who had always taken a deep interest in the scientific career of his nephew not only invited him to his house but assigned to him for an observatory the part of which was best adapted for that purpose tycho cheerfully accepted of this liberal offer the immediate proximity of heritswold to knudstorp rendered this arrangement peculiarly convenient and in the house of his uncle he experienced all that kindness and consideration which natural affection and a love of science combined to cherish when steno learned that the study of chemistry was one of the pursuits of his nephew he granted him a spacious house a few yards distant from the convent for his laboratory tycho lost no time in fitting up his observatory and providing his furnaces and regarding gold and silver and other metals as stars of the earth he used to represent his two opposite pursuits as forming only one science namely celestial and terrestrial astronomy in the hopes of enriching himself by pursuits of alchemy tycho devoted most of his attention to those satellites of gold and silver which now constituted his own system and which disturbed by their powerful action the hitherto uniform moments of their primary his affections were ever turning to germany where astronomers of kindred views and artists of surpassing talent were to be found in almost every city the want of money alone prevented him from realizing his wishes and it was in the hope of attaining the means of travelling that he in a great measure forsook his sextants for his crucibles in order however that he might have one good instrument in his observatory he constructed a sextant similar to but somewhat larger than that which he had presented to heinzel its limb was made of solid brass and was exquisitely divided into single minutes of degree its radius was strengthened with plates of brass and the apparatus for opening and shutting them was made with great accuracy the possession of this instrument was peculiarly fortunate for tycho for an event now occurred which roused him from his golden visions and directed all his faculties into their earlier and purer current on the eleventh november fifteen seventy two when he was returning to supper from his laboratory the clearness of the sky inspired him with the desire of completing some particular observations on looking up to the starry firmament he was surprised to see an extraordinary light in the constellation of cassiopeia which was then above his head he felt confident that he had never before observed such a star in that constellation and distrusting the evidence of his own senses he called out the servants and the peasants and having received their testimony that it was a huge star such as they had never seen before he was satisfied of the correctness of his own vision regarding it as a new and unusual phenomenon he hastened to his observatory adjusted his sextant and measured its distance from the nearest stars in cassiopeia he noted also its form its magnitude its light and its colour and he waited with great anxiety for the next night that he might determine the important point whether it was a fixed star or a body within or near to our own system for several years tycho had been in great practice of calculating at the beginning of each year a sort of almanac for his own use and in this he inserted all the observations which he had made on the new star and the conclusion which he had drawn from them having gone to copenhagen in the course of ensuing spring he showed his manuscript to john pretinius a professor in whose house he was always hospitably received charles danzus the french ambassador and a person of great learning having heard of tycho's arrival invited himself to dine with him at the house of patinus the conversation soon turned upon the new star and tycho found his companion very sceptical about its existence danzus was particularly jocular on the subject and attacked the danes for their inattention to so important a science as astronomy tycho received this lecture in good temper and with anxious expectation that a clear sky would enable him to give a practical refutation of the attack which was made upon his country the night turned out serene and the whole party saw with astonishment the new star under the most favourable circumstances 
Platensis conceived that it was similar to one observed by Hippocarpus, and urged Tycho to publish the observations which he had made upon it. Tycho refused to accede to this request, on the pretext that his work was not sufficiently perfect, but the true reason, as he afterwards acknowledged, was that he considered it would be a disgrace for a nobleman either to study such subjects or to communicate them to the public. This absurd notion was with some difficulty overcome, and through the earnest entreaties and assistances of Pratensis, his work on the new star was published in 1573. This remarkable body presents to us one of the most interesting phenomena in astronomy. The date of its first appearance was not been exactly ascertained. Tycho saw it on 11th of November, but Cornelius Gemma had seen it on 9th, Paul Heinzel saw it on 7th of August at Augsburg, and Wolfgangus Clurus observed it in Wittenberg on the 6th. Tycho conjectures that it was first seen on 5th, and Hierinomius Munsius asserts that at Valencia, in Spain, it was not seen on the 2nd, when he was showing that part of the heavens to his pupils. This singular star continued to be seen during 16 months, and did not disappear till the March 1574. In its appearance, it was exactly like a star, having none of the distinct marks of a comet. It twinkled strongly and grew larger than Lyra or Sirius, or any other fixed star. It seemed to be somewhat larger than Jupiter when he was nearest the Earth, and rivaled the Venus in her great brightness. In the first month of its appearance, it was less than Jupiter. In the second, it equaled him. In the third, it surpassed him in the splendor. In the fourth, it was equal to Sirius. In the fifth, to Lyra. In the sixth and seventh, to stars of second magnitude. In the eighth, ninth and tenth, to the stars of third magnitude. In the eleventh, twelfth and thirteenth, to the stars of fourth magnitude. In the fourteenth and fifteenth, to the stars of fifth magnitude. And in the sixteenth month, to the stars of sixth magnitude. After this, it became so small that it at last disappeared. Its color changed also with its size. At first it was white and bright, and in the third month it began to become yellowish. In the fifth it became reddish, like Aldebaran, and in the seventh and eighth it became bluish, like the Saturn, growing afterwards duller and duller. Its place in the heavens was invariable. Its longitude was in the sixth degree and fifty-fourth minute of Taurus, and its latitude fifty-three degree forty-five minutes north. Its right ascension was zero degree twenty six two fifth minute and its declination sixty one degree forty six three fourth minute. It had no parallax and was unquestionably situated in the region of the fixed stars. After Tycho had published his book, he proposed to travel into Germany and Italy, but he was seized with a fever, and he had no sooner recovered from it than he became involved in a love affair which frustrated all his schemes. Although Tycho was afraid of casting a stain upon his nobility by publishing his observations on the new star, yet he did not scruple to debase his lineage by marrying a peasant girl of the village of Knudstorp. This event took place in 1573, and in 1574 his wife gave birth to his daughter, Magdalene. Tycho's noble relations were deeply offended at his imprudent step, and so far did the mutual animosity of the parties extend that the king himself was obliged to effect a reconciliation. The fame of our author as an astronomer and mathematician was now so high that several young Danish nobles requested him to deliver a course of lectures upon these interesting subjects. This application was seconded by Partensis, Danzus, and all his best friends. But their solicitations were vain. The king at last made the request in a way which ensured its being granted, and Tycho delivered a course of lectures in which he not only gave the full view of science of astronomy, but defended and explained the reveries of astrology. Having finished his lectures and arranged his domestic affairs, he set out on his projected journey, about the beginning of the spring of 1575, leaving behind him his wife and daughter, till he should fix upon a place of permanent residence. The first town which he visited was Hesse Castle, the residence of William, Langrave of Hesse, whose patronage of astronomy and whose skill in making celestial observations have immortalized his name. Here Tycho spent eight or ten delightful days, during which the two astronomers were occupied, one half of the day in scientific conversation, and the other half in astronomical observations. 
and he would have prolonged a visit which gave him so much pleasure had not the death of one of the langrave's daughter interrupted their labours passing through frankfort tycho went to switzerland and after visiting many cities on his way he fixed upon basel as the place of residence not only from his centrical position but from the salubrity of the air and the cheapness of the living from switzerland he went to venice and returning through germany he came to ratisbon at the time of the congress which had been called together on the first of november for the coronation of the emperor rudolph on this occasion he met with several distinguished individuals who were not only skilled in astronomy but who were among its warmest patrons from ratisbon he passed to salfeld and thence to wittemburg where he saw the parallactic instruments and the wooden quadrant which had been used by john pratensis in determining the latitude of the city and measuring the altitudes of the new star tycho was now impatient from home and he lost no time in returning to denmark where the events were awaiting him which frustrated all his schemes by placing him in the most favourable situation for promoting his own happiness and advancing the interests of astronomy End of chapter 7 Read by Lambda Chapter 8 of The Martyrs of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Martyrs of Science by David Brewster life of tycho brahe chapter two frederick second patronizes tycho and resolves to establish him in denmark grants him the highland of un for life and builds a splendid observatory of uraniburg description of the island and of the observatory account of its astronomical instruments tycho begins his observations his pupils tycho is made canon of rothschild and receives a large pension as hospitality to his visitors ingratitude of Vilcius. tycho sends an assistant to take the latitude of fraunburg and konigsberg is visited by ulric duke of mecklenburg change in tycho's fortunes the patronage which had been extended to astronomers by several of reigning princes of germany especially by the landgrave of hesse and augustus elector of saxony had begun to excite a love of science in the minds of other sovereigns the king of denmark seems to have felt it as a stain upon his character that the only astronomer in his dominance should carry on his observations in distant kingdoms and adorn by his discoveries other courts than his own with this feeling he sent ambassadors to hesse castle to inquire after tycho and to intimate him his wish that he should return to denmark and his anxiety to promote the advancement of astronomy in his own dominions tycho had left castle when these messengers arrived and had heard nothing of the king's intention till he was about to quit knutstrop with his family for basel at the time he was surprised at the arrival of a noble messenger who brought a letter requesting him to meet the king as soon as possible at copenhagen tycho lost no time in obeying the royal summons the king received him with the most flattering kindness he offered to give him a grant for life of the island of huen between denmark and sweden and to construct and furnish with instruments at his own expense an observatory as well as a house for accommodation of his family together with a laboratory for carrying on his chemical inquiries tycho who truly loved his country was deeply affected with the munificence of the royal offer he accepted of it with the warmth of gratitude which it was calculated to inspire he particularly rejoiced in the thought that if any success should attend his future labours the glory of it would belong to his native land the island of huen is about six miles from the coast of zealand three from that of sweden and fourteen from copenhagen it is six miles in circumference and rises into the form of a mountain which though very high terminates in a plain it is nowhere rocky and even in the time of tycho it produced the best kind of grains afforded excellent pasturage for horses cattle and sheep and possessed deer hares rabbits and partridges in abundance it contained at that time only one village with forty inhabitants having surveyed his new territory tycho resolved to build a magnificent tower in the centre of the elevated plain 
which he resolved to call Uraniburg, or the City of the Heavens. Having made the necessary arrangements, he repaired to the island on the 8th of August, and his friend Charles Densus laid the foundation stone on the new observatory, which consisted of a slab of porphyry, with the following inscription, Regnante in Dania Frederico II, Carlos Dancius Aquitanus, R. G. E. D. L. Dominic Philosophiae Imprisque Astrorum Contemplationi, Regis Decreto a Nobili Viro Ticoni Brahi de Knudstrop, Extrucie Votivum Hunc Lapidem Memoriae e Felicis Auspici Ergopi Anno, Cic Ic L. X. X. D. Vit Augusti. The ceremony was performed early in the morning of a splendid day, in which the rising sun threw its blessing upon Frederick, and upon the party of the noblemen and philosophers who had assembled to testify their law of science. An entertainment was provided for the occasion, and copious libations of variety of wines were offered for the success of the undertaking. The observatory was surrounded by a rampart, each face of which was three hundred feet long. About the middle of each face the rampart became a semicircle, the inner diameter of which was ninety feet. The height of the rampart was twenty-two feet, and its thickness at the base twenty. Its four angles corresponded exactly with four cardinal points, and at the north and south angles were erected turrets, of which one was a printing house, and the other a residence of the servants. Gates were erected at east and west angles, and above them were apartments for reception of strangers. Within the rampart was a shrubbery, with about three hundred varieties of trees, and at the centre of each semicircular part of the rampart was a bower or a summer house. This shrubbery surrounded the flower garden, which was terminated within a circular wall about forty-five feet high, which enclosed a more elevated area, in the centre of which stood the principal building in the observatory, and from which four paths led to the above-mentioned angles, with as many doors for entering the garden. The principal building was about sixty feet square, the doors were placed on the east and west sides, and on the north and south fronts were attached two round towers, whose inner diameter was about thirty-two feet, and which formed the observatories, which had windows in their roof, that could be opened towards any part of the heavens. The accommodations for the family were numerous and splendid. Under the observatory, in the south tower, was the museum and library, and below this again was the laboratory in subterraneous crypt containing sixteen furnaces of various kinds. Beneath this was a well forty feet deep, and from which water was distributed by siphons to every part of the building. Besides the principal building, there were two situated without the rampart, one to the north, containing a workshop for the construction of astronomical and other instruments, and the other to the south, which was occupied as a sort of farmhouse. These buildings cost the king of Denmark, hundred thousand rix dollars twenty thousand pounds and tycho is said to have expended upon them a similar sum as the two towers could not accommodate the instruments which tycho required for his observations he found it necessary to erect on the hill about sixty paces to the south of the uraniburg a subterranean observatory in which he might place his larger instruments which required to be firmly fixed and to be protected from the wind and the weather this observatory which he called strainberg or the mountain of the stars consisted of several crypts separated by solid walls and to these there was a subterranean passage from the laboratory in uraniburg the various buildings which tycho erected were built in regular style of architecture and were highly ornamented not only with external decorations but with statues and pictures of the most distinguished astronomers from Hippocarpus and Ptolemy down to Copernicus, and with inscriptions and poems in the honour of astronomers. While these buildings were erecting, and after their completion, Tycho was busily occupied in preparing instruments for observation. These were of the most splendid description, and the reader will form some notion of their grandeur, and their expense from the following list. In the south and greater observatory, a semicircle of solid iron covered with brass, four cubits radius, a sextant of the same materials and size, a quadrant of one and a half cubits radius, and an azimuth circle of three cubits, Ptolemy's parallactic rules, 
covered with brass, four cubits inside. The sextant already described in page 134. Another quadrant, like number third. Zodiacal armillaries of melted brass and turned out of solid of three cubits in diameter. Near this observatory was a large clock with one wheel two cubits in diameter and two smaller ones which like it indicated hours, minutes and seconds. In the south and lesser observatory a armillary sphere of brass with steel meridian whose diameter was about four cubits. In the north observatory brass parallactic rules which revolved in azimuth above a brass horizon twelve feet in diameter a half sextant of four cubits radius a steel sextant another half sextant with steel limb four cubits radius the parallactic rules of copernicus equatorial armillaries a quadrant of solid plate of brass five cubits in radius showing every ten seconds in the museum was a large globe made at augsburg in the Steinberg observatory in the central part a large semicircle with a brass limb and three clocks showing hours minutes and seconds equatorial armillaries of seven cubits with semi armillaries of nine cubits a sextant of four cubits radius a geometrical square of iron with an intercepted quadrant of five cubits and divided into fifteen seconds a quadrant of four cubits radius showing ten seconds with an azimuth circle zodiacal armillaries of brass with steel meridians three cubits in diameter a sextant of brass kept together by screws and capable of being taken to pieces for travelling with its radius was about four cubits a movable armillary spear three cubits in diameter a quadrant of brass one cubits radius and divided into minutes by nonian circles an astronomical radius of solid brass three cubits long an astronomical ring of brass a cubit in diameter a small brass astrolabe in almost all the instruments now enumerated the limb was subdivided by diagonal lines a method which tycho first brought into use but which in modern times has been superseded by inventions of nonius and vernier when tycho had thus furnished his observatory he devoted himself to examination of the stars and during twenty-one years which he spent in this delightful occupation he made vast additions to astronomical science in order to instruct the young in the art of observation and educate assistants for his observatory he had sometimes under his roof from six to twelve pupils whom he boarded and educated some of these were named by the king and educated at his expense others were sent by different academics and cities and several who had presented themselves on their own accord were liberally admitted by the generous astronomer as tycho had spent nearly a ton of gold about hundred thousand dollars in his outlay of uraniburg his own income was reduced to very narrow limits to supply this defect frederick gave him an annual pension of two thousand dollars besides an estate in norway and made him canon of episcopal church of rothschild or prebend of st lawrence which had an annual income of thousand dollars and which was burdened only by the expense of keeping up the chapel containing the mausolea of the kings of the family of oldenburg it would have been an unprofitable task and one by no means interesting to general reader to give a detailed history of the various astronomical observations and discoveries which were made by tycho during the twenty years which he spent at uraniburg every phenomenon that appeared in the heavens he observed with the greatest care while he at the same time carried on regular series of observations of determining the place of the fixed stars and for improving the tables of the sun moon and planets though almost wholly devoted to those noble pursuits yet he kept an open house and received with unbounded hospitality the crowds of philosophers nobles and princes who came to be introduced to the first astronomer of the age and to admire the splendid temple which the danish sovereign had consecrated to science among the strangers whom he received under his roof there were some who returned his kindness with ingratitude among these was paul vitius a mathematician who under the pretence of devoting his whole life to astronomy insinuated himself to the utmost familiarity with tycho the unsuspecting astronomer explained to his guest all his inventions described all his methods and even made him acquainted with those views which he had not realized and with instruments which he had not yet executed when which he had thus obtained possession of these methods 
and inventions and views of Tycho, and had enjoyed his hospitality for three months, he pretended that he was obliged to return to Germany to receive an inheritance to which he had succeeded. After quitting Uraniburg, this ungrateful mathematician neither returned to see Tycho nor kept up any correspondence with him, and it was not till five years after his departure that Tycho learned from the letters of the Prince of Hesse to Ranzau that which he has had passed through Hesse and had described as his own the various inventions and methods which had been shown to him in Huen. Being unable to reconcile his own observations with those of Copernicus and with the Plutonic tables, Tycho resolved to obtain new determinations of the latitude of Ronberg in Prussia, where Copernicus made his observations, and of Königsberg in the meridian in which Reinhold had adopted his Plutonic tables. For these purposes he sent one of his assistants, Elias Morsianus, with a proper instrument under the protection of Pilevus, ambassador of Margrave of Hanpach, to the king of Denmark, who was returning by sea to Germany, and after receiving the greatest attention and assistance from the noble canons of Ermland, he determined from nearly a month's observations on the sun and the stars that the latitude of Fraunberg was fifty four degree twenty two and a half minute in place of fifty four degree nineteen and a half minute as given by Copernicus. In like manner he determined that the latitude of Königsberg was fifty four degree forty three minutes in place of fifty four degree seventeen minutes as adopted by Reinhold. When Morsianus returned to Huyen in July, he brought with him, as a present to Tycho, from John Hanius, one of the canons of Ermland, the Ptolemaic rules or the parallactic instrument which Copernicus had used and made with his own hands. It consisted of two equal wooden rules, five cubits long, and divided into 1,414 parts. Tycho preserved this gift as one peculiarly dear to him, and on the day of his receiving it he composed a set of verses in honour of the great astronomer to whom it belonged among the distinguished visits which were paid to tycho we must enumerate that ulrich duke of mecklenburg in fifteen eighty six although his daughter sophia queen of denmark had already paid two visits to uraniburg in the same year yet such was her love of astronomy that she accompanied her father and his wife elizabeth on this occasion, Ulrich was not only fond of science in general, but had for many years devoted himself to chemical pursuits, and he was therefore peculiarly gratified in examining the splendid laboratory and extensive apparatus which Tycho possessed. It has been said by some of the biographers of Tycho that the Landgrave of Hesse visited Uraniburg about this period, but this opinion is not correct, as it was only his astronomer and optician, Rothman, who made the journey to Huyen in 1591 for the recovery of his health. Tycho had long carried on a correspondence with this able astronomer respecting the observations made at the observatory of Hesse Castle, and during the few months which they now spent together, they discussed in amplest manner all the questions which had previously been agitated. Rothman was astonished at wonderful apparatus which he saw at Uraniburg, and returned to his native land charmed by the hospitality of the Danish astronomer. Hitherto we have followed Tycho through a career of almost unexampled prosperity. When he had scarcely reached his thirtieth year, he was established, by the kindness and liberality of his sovereign, in the most splendid observatory that had ever been erected in Europe, and a thriving family, an ample income, and a widely extended reputation were added to his blessings. Of the value of these gifts, he was deeply sensible, and he enjoyed them the more that he received them with a grateful heart. Tycho was a Christian as well as a philosopher. The powers of his gift and mind have been amply displayed in astronomical labours, but we shall now have a vocation to witness his piety and resignation in submitting to an unexpected and adverse destiny. End of chapter 8 Read by Lambda Chapter 9 of The Martyrs of Science this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Martyrs of Science by David Brewster. Life of Tycho Brahe. Chapter 3. 
Tycho's labours do honour to his country. Death of Frederick II. James IV of Scotland visits Tycho to Uraniburg. Christian IV visits Tycho. The Duke of Brunswick's visit to Tycho. The Danish nobility, jealous of his fame, conspire against him. He is compelled to quit Uraniburg and to abandon his studies. Cruelty of Minister Walchendorp. Tycho quits Denmark with his family and instruments. Is hospitably received by Count Ranzu, who introduces him to the Emperor Rudolf. The Emperor invites him to Prague. He gives him a pension of 3,000 crowns and the castle of Benak as a residence and an observatory. Kepler visits Tycho, who obtains for him the appointment of mathematician to Rudolf. The love of astronomy, which had been so unequivocally exhibited by Frederick II and his royal consort, inspired their courtiers with at least an outward respect for science, and among the ministers and the advisers of the king, Tycho recalled many ardent friends. It was everywhere felt that Denmark had elevated herself among the nations of Europe by her liberality to Tycho, and the peaceful glory which he had in return conferred upon his country was not of a kind to dissatisfy even rival nations. In the conquests of science, no widows or orphans tears are shed, no captives are dragged from their homes, and no devoted victims are yoked to the chariot wheels of triumphant philosopher. The newly acquired domains of knowledge belong, in right of conquest, to all nations, and Denmark had now earned the gratitude of Europe by the magnitude as well as the success of her contingent. An event, however, now occurred which threatened with destruction the interests of Danish science. In the beginning of April 1588, Frederick II died in the 54th year of his age and the 29th of his reign. His remains were conveyed to Rothschild and deposited in the chapel under Tycho's care, where a finely executed bust of him was afterwards placed. His son and successor, Christian IV, was only in the 11th year of his age, and though his temper and disposition were good, Yet Tycho had reason to be alarmed at the possibility of his discontinuing the patronage of astronomy. The taste for science, however, which had sprung up in the Danish court, had extended itself no wider than the influence of the reigning sovereign. The parasites of royalty saw themselves eclipsed in the bright renown which Tycho had acquired, and every new visit to Uraniburg by a foreign prince supplied fresh fuel to the rancor, which had long been smothering in their breasts. The ascension of a youthful king held out to his enemies an opportunity of destroying the influence of Tycho, and though no adverse steps was taken, yet he had the sagacity to foresee, in trifles light as air, the approaching confirmation of his fears. Hope, however, still cheered him amid his labours, but that hope was founded chiefly on the learning and character of Nicholas Cassius, the chancellor of the kingdom, from whom he had experienced the warmest attentions. Among the princes who visited Uraniburg, there were none who conducted themselves with more condescension and generosity than our own sovereign, James IV. In the year 1590, when the Scottish king repaired to Denmark to celebrate his marriage with Prince Anne, the king's sister, he paid a visit to Tycho, attended by his counsellors and a large suite of nobility. During the eight days which he spent at Uraniburg, James carried on long discussions with Tycho on various subjects but chiefly on the motion which Copernicus had ascribed to the earth. He exclaimed narrowly all the astronomical instruments and made himself acquainted with the principles of their construction and the method of using them. He inspected the busts and the pictures in the museum, and when he perceived the portrait of George Buchanan, his own perceptor, he could not refrain from the strongest expressions of delight. Upon quitting the hospitable roof of Tycho, James not only presented him with a magnificent donation, but afterwards gave him his royal license to publish his works in England during seventy years. The license was accompanied with the following high eulogium on his abilities and learning. Nor have I become acquainted with these kings only from the relations of others, or from a bad inspection of your works, but I have seen them before my own eyes, and I have heard them with my own ears, in your residence at Uraniburg, and I have drawn them from the various learned and agreeable conversations which I there held with you and which even now affect my mind to such a degree that it is difficult to determine whether i recollect them with greater pleasure or admiration as i now willingly testify by this license 
to present and to future generations at the request of tycho the king composed and wrote in his own hand some latin verses which were more complimentary than classical his chancellor had composed some verses of a similar character during his visit to tycho a short specimen of these will be deemed sufficient by the classical reader vidit e obustipui rex quienum scotius almam miratus clari tot monumento viri in the year fifteen ninety one christian fourth had reached his fourteenth year he expressed a desire to pay a visit to uraniburg he accordingly set out with a large party consisting of his three principal senators and other councillors and noblemen and having examined the various instruments in the observatories and laboratory he proposed to tycho various questions on mechanics and mathematics but particularly on the principles of fortification and shipbuilding having observed that he had particularly admired a brass globe which by means of internal wheelwork imitated the diurnal motion of the heavens the rising and setting of the sun and the phases of the moon tycho made him a present of it and received in return an elegant gold chain with his majesty's picture with an assurance of his unalterable attachment and protection notwithstanding this assurance tycho had already as we have stated began to suspect the designs of his enemies and in a letter addressed to langrave of hesse early in fifteen ninety one he throws out some hints which indicated the anxieties that agitated his mind the langrave of hesse as if he had heard some rumours unfavourable to the prospects of tycho requested him to write him respecting the state of the kingdom and concerning his own private affairs to this letter which was dated early in february tycho replied about the beginning of april he informed the langrave that he had a private life in his own island exempt from all official functions and never willingly taking a part in public affairs he was desirous of leaving the ambition of public honours to others and of devoting himself wholly to the study of philosophy and astronomy and he expressed a hope that if he should be involved in tumults and troubles of life either by his own destiny or by evil counsels he might be able by the blessing of god to extricate himself by the force of his mind and the integrity of his life he comforted himself with the idea that every soil was the country of a great man and that wherever he went the blue sky would still be over his head and he distinctly states at the close of his letter that he had thought of transferring his residence to some other place as there were some of the king's counsellors who had already begun to culminate his studies and to grudge him his pension from the treasury the causes which led to this change of feeling on the part of christian force advisers have not been explained by the biographers of tycho it has been stated in general terms that he had made many enemies by the keenness of his temper and the severity of his satire but i have not been able to discover any distinct example of these peculiarities of this mind in an event indeed which occurred about this time he slightly resented a piece of marked incivility on the part of henry julius duke of brunswick who had married the princess eliza of denmark but it is not likely that so trivial an affair if it were known at court could have called down upon him the hostility of king's advisers the duke of brunswick had in fifteen ninety paid a visit to uraniburg and had particularly admired an antique brass statue of mercury about a cubit long which tycho had placed in the roof of the hypocaust on the central crypt of the Steinberg observatory by means of a concealed mechanism it moved round in circular orbit the duke requested the statue and its machinery which tycho gave him on the condition that he should obtain a model of it for the purpose of having another executed by a skilful workman the duke not only forgot his promise but paid no attention to the letters which were addressed to him tycho was justly irritated at this unprincely conduct and ordered his anecdote to be inserted in the inscription of uraniburg which he was now preparing for publication in the year fifteen ninety two tycho lost his distinguished friend and correspondent the prince of hesse and astronomy one of its most active and intelligent cultivators his grief on this occasion was deep and sincere he gave utterance to his feelings in an impassioned elegy in which he recorded the virtues and talents of his friend prince maurice the son and successor of langrave continued with the assistance of able observers to keep up the reputation of the observatory of hesse castle and the observations which were there made were afterwards published by snellius 
the extensive and valuable correspondence between tycho and the landgrave was prepared for publication about the beginning of fifteen ninety three and contains also the letters of rotham and ranzau for several years the studies of tycho had been treated with an unwilling toleration by the danish court many of the nobles envied the munificent establishment which he had received from frederick and the liberal pension which he drew from his treasury but among his most active enemies were some physicians who envied his reputation as a successful and gracious practitioner of the healing art numbers of invalids flocked to fuyen and diseases which resisted all other methods of cure are said to have yielded to the panaceal prescription of the astrologer under the influence of such motives these individuals succeeded in exciting against tycho the hostility of the court they drew the public attention to the exhausted state of the treasury they maintained that he had possessed too long the state in norway which might be given to men who laboured more usefully for the commonwealth and they accused him of allowing the chapel at Rostel to fall into decay the president of the council christopher walkendorp and the king's chancellor were the most active of the enemies of tycho and having poisoned the mind of their sovereign against the most meritorious of his subjects tycho was deprived of his canonry his estate in norway and his pension being no longer able to bear the expenses of his establishment in hoyen and dreading that the feelings which had been excited against him might be still further roused so as to deprive him of the island of hoyen itself he resolved to transfer his instruments to some other situation notwithstanding this resolution he remained with his family in the island and continued his observations till the spring of fifteen ninety seven when he took a house in copenhagen and removed to it all his smaller and more portable instruments leaving those which are large or fixed in the crypts of Strainberg. his first plan was to remove everything from huyen as a measure of security but the public feeling began to turn in his favour and there were many good men in copenhagen who did not scruple to reprobate the conduct of the government the president of the council walkendorp a name which while the heavens revolve will be pronounced with horror by astronomers saw the change of the sentiment which his injustice had produced and adopted an artful method of sheltering himself from public odium in consequence of a quarrel with tycho the recollection of which had rankled in his breast he dreaded to be the prime mover in his persecution he therefore appointed a committee of two persons one of whom was thomas fuscius to report to the government on the nature and utility of the studies of tycho these two individuals were entirely ignorant of astronomy and the use of instruments and even if they had not they would have been equally subservient to the views of the minister they reported that the studies of tycho were of no value and that they were not only useless but noxious armed with this report walkendorp prohibited tycho in the king's name from continuing his chemical experiments and instigated no doubt by this wicked minister an attack was made upon himself and a shepherd or a steward was injured in the affray tycho was provoked to revenge himself upon his enemies and the judge was commanded not to interfere in the matter thus persecuted by his enemies tycho resolved to remain no longer in the ungrateful country he carried from heaven everything that was movable and having packed up his instruments his crucibles and his books he hired a ship to convey them to some foreign land his wife his five sons and four daughters his male and female servants and many of his pupils and assistants among whom were tengnagel his future son-in-law and the celebrated longo montanus embarked at copenhagen to seek the hospitality of some better country than their own freighted with the glory of denmark this interesting bark made the best of its way across the baltic and arrived safely at rostock here the exiled patriarch found many of his early friends particularly henry bruce an able astronomer to whom he had formally presented one of his brass quadrants the approach of plague however prevented tycho from making any arrangements for a permanent residence and having received a warm invitation from count henry ranzow who lived in holstein at the castle of vandesberg near hamburg he went with all his family about the end of fifteen ninety seven to enjoy the hospitality of his friend though tycho derived the highest pleasure from the kindness and conversation of count ranzow 
yet a cloud overshadowed the future and he had yet to seek for a patron and a home his hopes were fixed on emperor rudolph who was not only fond of science but who was especially addicted to alchemy and astrology and his friend ranzau promised to have him introduced to the emperor by proper letters when tycho learned that rudolph was particularly fond of mechanical instruments and of chemistry he resolved to complete and to dedicate to him his work on the mechanics of astronomy and to add to it an account of his chemical labours this task he soon performed and his work appeared in fifteen ninety eight under the title of tychonis brahe astronomy in statue mechanica along with this work he transmitted to the emperor a copy of his manuscript catalogue of thousand fixed stars with these proofs of his service to science and instigated by various letters in his favour the emperor rudolph desired his vice-chancellor to send for tycho and to assure him that he would be received according to his great merits and that nothing would should be wanting to promote his scientific studies leaving his wife and daughters at vandesburg and taking with him his sons and his pupils tycho went to wittemberg but having learned that the plague had broken out at prague and that the emperor had gone to pilsen he deferred for a while his journey into bohemia early in the spring fifteen ninety nine when the pestilence had ceased at prague and the emperor had returned to his capital tycho set out for bohemia on his arrival at prague he found a splendid house ready for his reception and a kind message from the emperor prohibiting him from paying his respects to him till he had recovered from the fatigues of his journey on his presentation to rudolph the generous emperor received him with the most distinguished kindness he announced to him that he had to receive an annual pension of three thousand crowns that an estate would as soon as possible be settled upon him and his family and their successors that a town house would be provided for him and that he might have his choice of various castles and houses in the country as a site of his observatory and laboratory the emperor had also taken care to provide everything that was necessary for tycho's immediate wants and so overwhelmed was he with such unexpected kindness that he remarked that as he could not find words to express his gratitude the whole heavens should speak for him and the posterity should know what a refuge his great and good sovereign had been to the queen of the arts among the numerous friends whom tycho found at prague were his correspondents corodotius and hegesius and his benefactor barovitius the emperor's secretary he was congratulated by them all on his distinguished reception at court and was regarded at the aeneas of science who had been driven from his peaceful home and who had carried with them to the latium of the germany his wife his children and his household gods if external circumstances could remove the sorrows of the past tycho must now have been supremely happy in his spacious mansion which had belonged to his friend curtius he had a position for one of his best instruments and having covered with his poetical inscriptions the four sides of the pedestal on which it stood in honour of his benefactors as well as of former astronomers he resumed with diligence his examination of the stars when rudolph saw the magnificent instruments which tycho had brought along with him and had acquired some knowledge of their use he pressed him to send to denmark for the still larger ones which had left at steinberg in the meantime he gave him the choice of castles at Branzium, lisa and benach as his country residence and after visiting them about the end of may tycho gave the preference to benach which was situated upon a rising ground and commanded an extensive horizon it contained splendid and commodious buildings and was almost as he calls it a small city situated on the stream lizor near its confluence with the albus it stood a little to the east and north of prague and was distant from that city only five german miles or about six hours journey on the twentieth august the prefect of branzium gave tycho possession of his new residence his gratitude to his royal patron was copiously displayed not only in a latin poem written on the occasion but in latin inscriptions which he placed above the doors of his observatory and his laboratory in order that he might establish an astronomical school at prague he wrote to logomonitus kepler muller david fabricius and two students at wittemberg who were good calculators requesting them to reside with them at benach as his assistants and pupils 
he at the same time despatched his distant son-in-law technical accompanied by pascal mullers to bring home his wife and daughters from vandesburg and his instruments from huyen and he begged that logomonotanus would accompany them to denmark and return in the same carriage with them to bohemia kepler arrived at prague in january sixteen hundred and after spending three or four months at benach in carrying on his inquiries and in making astronomical observations he returned to graz tycho had undertaken to obtain for him the appointment of his assistant it was arranged that the emperor should allow him a hundred florins on the condition that the states of styria would permit him to retain his salary for two years this scheme however failed and kepler was about to study medicine and offer himself for a professorship of medicine at tubingen when tycho undertook to obtain him a permanent appointment from the emperor kepler accordingly returned in september sixteen o one and on the recommendation of his friend he was named imperial mathematician on the condition of assisting tycho in his observations tycho had experienced much inconvenience in his residence at benach from his ignorance of the language and the customs of the country as well as from other causes he was therefore anxious to transfer his instruments to prague and no sooner were his wishes conveyed to the emperor than he gave him leave to send them to the royal gardens and the adjacent buildings his family and his larger instruments having now arrived from huyen the astronomer with his family and his property were safely lodged in the royal edifice having found that there was no house in prague more suited for his purpose than that of his late friend crucius the emperor purchased it from his widow and tycho moved into it on the twenty fifth february sixteen o one end of chapter nine read by lambda chapter ten of the martyrs of science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the martyrs of science by david brewster life of tycho brag chapter four tycho resumes his astronomical observations is attacked with a painful disease his sufferings and death in sixteen o one his funeral his temper his turn for satire and raillery his piety account of his astronomical discoveries his love of astrology and alchemy observations on the character of the alchemists tycho's elixir his fondness for the marvellous his automata and invisible bells account of the idiot called lep whom he kept as a prophet history of tycho's instruments his great brass globe preserved at copenhagen present state of the highland of huen although tycho continued in his new position to observe the planets with his usual assiduity yet the recollection of his sufferings and the inconveniences and disappointments which he had experienced began to prey upon his mind and to affect his health notwithstanding the continued liberality of the emperor and the kindness of his friends and pupils he was yet a stranger in a distant land misfortune was unable to subdue that love of country which was one of the most powerful of his affections and though its ingratitude might have broken the chain which bound him to the land of its nativity it seems only to have riveted it more firmly his imagination thus influenced acquired an undue predominance over his judgment he viewed the most trifling occurrences as supernatural indications and in those azure moments when the clouds broke from his mind and when he displayed his usual wit and pleasantry he frequently turned the conversation to the subject of this latter end this state of mind was the forerunner though probably the effect of a painful disease which had doubtless its origin in the severity and continuity of his studies on the thirteenth october when he was supping at the house of a nobleman called rosenberg he was seized with the retention of urine which forced him to leave the party this attack continued with little intermission for more than a week and during this period he suffered great pain attended with a want of sleep and temporary delirium during which he frequently exclaimed ne frustra vixi se on the twenty fourth 
he recovered from this painful situation and became perfectly tranquil his strength however was gone and he saw that he had not many hours to live he expressed an anxious wish that his labours would be redound to glory of his maker to whom he offered up the most ardent prayers he enjoined his sons and his son-in-law not to allow them to be lost he encouraged his pupils not to abandon their pursuits he requested kepler to complete the rudolphine tables and to his family he recommended piety and resignation to the divine will among those who never quitted tycho in his illness was eric Brach, count Wittehorn, a swede and a relation of his own and a counsellor to the king of poland this amiable individual never left the bedside of his friend and administered to him all those attentions which his situation required tycho turning to him thanked him for his affectionate kindness and requested him to maintain the relationship with his family he then expired without pain amid the consolations the prayers and the tears of his friends this event took place on the twenty fourth of october sixteen o one when he was only fifty four years and ten months old the emperor rudolf evinced the greatest sorrow when he was informed of the death of his friend and he gave orders that he should be buried in the most honourable manner in the principal church of the ancient city the funeral took place on the fourth november and he was interred in the dress of a nobleman and with ceremonies of his order the funeral oration was pronounced by jesinius before a distinguished assemblage and many elegies were written on his death tycho was a little above the middle size and in the last years of his life he was slightly corpulent he had reddish yellow hair and ruddy complexion he was of a sanguine temperament and is said to have been sometimes irritable and even obstinate this falling however if he did possess it was not exhibited towards his pupils or his scientific friends who ever entertained for him the warmest affections and esteem some of his pupils had remained in his house more than twenty years and in the quarrel which arose between him and kepler and which is allowed to have originated entirely in the temper of the latter he conducted himself with the greatest patience and forbearance there is a reason to think that the irritability with which he has been charged was less an affection of his mind than the effect of that noble independence of character which belonged to him and that it has been inferred chiefly from his conduct to some of those high personages with whom he was brought into contact when valkendorp the president of the council kicked his favourite hound it was no proof of irritability of the character of tycho expressed in strong terms in disapprobation of the deed it was doubtless a great weakness in his character that he indulged his turn for satire without being able to bear retaliation his jocular habits too sometimes led him into disagreeable positions when the duke of brunswick was dining with them at uraniburg the duke said towards the end of the dinner that as it was late he must be going tycho jocularly remarked that this could not be done without his permission upon which the duke rose and left the party without taking leave of his host tycho became indignant in his turn and continued to sit at table but as if repenting of what he had done he followed the duke who was on his way to the ship and calling upon him displayed the cup in his hand as if he had washed out his offence by a draught of wine tycho was a man of true piety and cherished the deepest veneration of the sacred scriptures and for the great truths which they reveal their principles regulated his conduct and their promises animated his hopes his familiarity with the wonders of the heavens increased instead of diminishing his admiration of the divine wisdom and his daily conversation was elevated by a constant reference to a superintending providence as a practical astronomer tycho has not been surpassed by any observer of ancient or of modern times the splendour and number of his instruments the ingenuity with which he exhibited in inventing new ones and in improving and adding to those which were formerly known and his skill and assiduity as an observer have given a character to his labours and a value to his observations which will be appreciated to the latest posterity the appearance of the new star in fifteen seventy two led him to form a catalogue of 
777 stars, vastly superior in accuracy to those of Hippocarpus and Wulubage. His improvements on the lunar theory were still more valuable. He discovered the important inequality called the variation, and also the annual inequality which depends on the position of the earth in its orbit. He discovered also the inequality in the inclination of the moon's orbit and in the motion of her nodes. He determined with new accuracy the astronomical refractions from an altitude of 45 degree down to the horizon, where he found it to be 34 minute, and he had made vast collection of observations on the planets, which formed the groundwork of Kepler's discoveries and the basis of the Rudolphin tables. Tycho's powers of observation were not equalled by his capacity for general views. It was, perhaps, owing more to his veneration for the scriptures than to the vanity of giving his name to a new system, that he rejected the Copernican hypothesis. When he was led to propose a new system, called the Tychonic, in which the earth is stationary in the centre of the universe, while the sun, with all the other planets and comets revolving around him, performs his daily revolution about the earth, this arrangement of the planets afforded a sufficient explanation of the various phenomena of the heavens, and as it was consistent with the language of the scripture, and conformable to the indication of the senses, it found many supporters, notwithstanding the physical absurdity of making the whole system revolve round one of the smallest of the planets. It is a painful transition to pass from the astronomical labours of Tycho to his astrological and chemical pursuits, that Tycho studied and practised astrology has been universally admitted. He calculated the nativity of the Emperor Rudolph and foretold that his relations would make some attempts upon his life. The credulous emperor confided in the prediction, and when the conduct of his brother seemed to justify his belief, he confined himself to his palace and fell a prey to the fear which it inspired. Tycho, however, seems to have entirely renounced his astrological faith in his latter days and Kepler states, in the most pointed manner, that Tycho carried on his astronomical labours, with his mind entirely free from the superstitions of astrology, that he derided and detested the vanity and the knavery of astrologers, and was convinced that the stars exercised no influence on the destinies of men. Although Tycho informed Rothman that he had devoted as much labour and expense to the study of terrestrial chemistry, as he did to that of the celestial astronomy, yet it is a singular fact that he never published any account of his experiments, nor has he left among his writings any trace of his chemical inquiries. He pretended, however, to have made discoveries in the science, and we should have been disposed to reprobate the apology which he makes for not publishing them. Did we not know that it had been frequently given by other alchemists of the age, on consideration, says he, and by the advice of the most learned men, I thought it improper to unfold the secrets of the art of alchemy to the vulgar, as few persons were capable of using its mysteries to the advantage and without detriment. Admitting, then, as we must do, that Tycho was not only a professional alchemist, but that he was practically occupied with its pursuits, and continually misled by its delusions, it may be uninteresting to the reader to consider how far a belief in alchemy and a practice of its arts have a foundation in the weakness of human nature, and to what extent they are compatible with the piety and elevated moral feeling by which our author was distinguished. In the history of the human errors, two classes of impostors of very different characters present themselves to our notice. Those who willfully deluded their species and those who permitted their species to delude themselves. The first of those classes consisted of the selfish tyrants who upheld an unjust supremacy by systematic delusions, and of the growling mountebanks who quenched their avaricious thirst at the fountains of the credulity and the ignorance. The second class comprehended spirits of a nobler mould. It embraced speculative enthusiasts, whom the love of fame and the truth urged onward in a fruitless research and those great lights of knowledge and of virtue, who, while they stood forward as the landmarks of the age which they adorned, had neither the intellectual nor the moral courage to divest themselves of the supernatural radiance with which the ignorance of the vulgar had encircled them. 
the thrones and the shrines which delusion once sustained even in the civilized quarter of the globe are forever fallen and that civil and religious liberty which in past ages was kept on by the marvellous exhibitions of science to the senses is now maintained by its application to the reason of man the carlatans whether they deal in moral or in physical wonders from a race which is never so extinct they migrate to different zones of the social system and though they have changed their place and their purposes and their victims yet their character and motives remain the same the philosophical mind therefore is not disposed to study either of these varieties of impostors but the other two families which compose the second class are the objects of paramount interest the eccentricities and even the obliquities of great minds merit the scrutiny of the metaphysician and the moralist and they derive a peculiar interest from the state of the society in which they are exhibited had cardan and cornelius agrippa lived in modern times their vanity and self-importance would have been checked by the forms of society and even if their harmless pretensions had been displayed they would have disappeared in the blaze of their genius and knowledge but nursed in superstition and educated in dark and turbulent times when everything intellectual was in a state of restless transition the genius and character of great men necessarily reflected the peculiarities of the age in which they lived had history transmitted to us correct details of the leading alchemists and scientific magicians of the dark ages we should have been able to analyze their actions and their opinions and trace them probably to the ordinary principles by which the human mind is in every age influenced and directed but when a great man has once become an object either of interest or of wonder and still more when he is considered as the possessor of knowledge and skill which transcend the capacity of the age he is soon transformed into a hero of romance his powers are overrated his deeds exaggerated and he becomes the subject of idle legends which acquire a firmer hold on the credulity from the slight sprinkling of truth with which they are seasoned to disclaim the possession of lofty attributes thus ascribed to great men is a degree of humility which is not often exercised but even when the species of modesty is displayed it never fails to defeat its object it but calls forth a deeper homage and fixes the demigod more firmly in its shrine the history of learning furnishes us with many examples of that species of delusion in which a great mind submits itself to a vulgar adulation and renounces unwillingly if it renounces at all the unenviable reputation of supernatural agency in cases where the self-interest and ambition are the basis of this peculiarity of the temperament and in an age when the conjurer and the alchemist were the companions and even the idols of princes it is easy to trace the steps which a gifted sage retains his ascendancy among the ignorant the hecatomb which is sacrificed to the magician he revives as an oblation to his science unconscious of possessing real endowments the idol devours the meats that are offered to him without analyzing the motives and expectations under which he is fed but even when the idolater and his god are not placed in transverse relation the love of power or of notoriety is sufficient to induce good men to lend a too willing ear to vulgar testimony in favour of themselves and in our own times it is not common to repudiate the unmerited cheers of a popular assembly or to offer a contradiction to fictitious tales which record our talents or our courage our charity or our piety the conduct of the scientific alchemists of the thirteenth fourteenth and fifteenth centuries presents a problem of very difficult solution when we consider that a gas a fluid and a solid may consist of very same ingredients in different propositions that a virulent poison may differ from the most wholesome food only in the difference of quantity of the very same elements that gold and silver and lead and mercury and indeed all the metals may be extracted from transparent crystals which scarcely differ in their appearance from a piece of common salt or a bit of sugar candy and the diamond is nothing more than charcoal we need not greatly wonder at the extravagant expectations that the precious metals and the noblest gems 
might be procured from the basest materials these expectations too must have been often excited by startling results of their daily experiments the most ignorant compounder of simples could not fail to witness the magical transformation of chemical action and every new product must have added to the probability that the tempting doublets of gold and silver might be thrown down the dice box with which he was gambling but when the precious metals were found in lead and copper by the action of powerful reagents it is natural to suppose that they have been actually formed during the process and men of well-regulated minds even might have thus been led to embark in new adventures to procure a more copious supply without any insult being offered to the sober reason or any injury inflicted on sound morality when an ardent and ambitious mind is once dazzled with the fascination of some lofty pursuit where gold is the object or fame the impulse it is difficult to pass in a doubtful career and to make a voluntary shipwreck of the reputation which has been staked hope still cheers the aspirant from failure to failure till the loss of fortune and the decay of credit disturb the serenity of his mind and hurry him into the last resource of baffled ingenuity and disappointed ambition the philosopher thus becomes an impostor and by the pretended transmutation of the baser materials into gold or the discovery of the philosopher's stone he attempts to sustain his sinking reputation and recover the fortune he has lost the communication of the great secret is now the staple commodity with which he is to barter and the grand talisman with which he is to conjure it can be imparted only to a chosen few to those among the opulent who merit it by their virtues and can acquire it by their diligence and the divine vengeance is threatened against its disclosure a process commencing in fraud and terminating in mysticism is conveyed to wealthy aspirant or instilled into the young enthusiast and the grand mystery passes current for a reason till some cautious professor of the art like tycho denounces its publications as detrimental to society among the extravagant pretensions of the alchemists that of forming a universal medicine was perhaps not the most irrational it was only when they pretended to cure every disease and to confer longevity that they did violence to reason the success of the arabian physicians in the use of mercurial preparations naturally led to the belief that other medicines still more general in their application and efficacious in their healing powers might yet be brought to light and we have no doubt that many substantial discoveries were the result of such overstrained expectations tycho was not merely a believer in the medicinal dogmas of the alchemists he was actually the discoverer of a new elixir which went by his name and which was sold in every apothecary's shop as a specific against the epidemic diseases which were then ravaging germany the emperor rudolph having heard of this celebrated medicine obtained a small portion of it from tycho by the hands of the governor of brandisium but not satisfied with the gift he seems to have applied to tycho for an account of the method of preparing it tycho accordingly addressed to the emperor a long letter dated september seventh fifteen ninety nine containing a minute account of the process the base of this remarkable medicine is venetian treacle which undergoes an infinity of chemical operations and admixtures before it is ready for the patient when properly prepared he assures the emperor that it is better than gold and that it can be made still more valuable by mixing with it a single scruple either of tincture of corals or sapphire or hyacinth or a solution of pearls or of portable gold if it can be obtained free of all corrosive matter in order to render medicine universal for all diseases which can be cured by perspiration and which he says from a third of those which attack the human frame he combines it with antimony as a well-known pseudorific in the present practice of physic tycho concludes his letter by humbly beseeching the emperor to keep the process secret and reserve the medicine for himself alone the same disposition of mind which made tycho an astrologer and an alchemist inspired him with the singular love of the marvellous he had various automata with which he delighted to astonish the peasants and by means of invisible bells 
which communicated with every part of the establishment and which wrung with the gentlest touch he had great pleasure in bringing many of his pupils suddenly before strangers muttering at a particular time the words come hither peter as if he had commanded their presence by some supernatural agency if on leaving home he met with an old woman or a hare he returned immediately to his house but the most extraordinary of all these peculiarities remains to be noticed when he lived at uranibag he maintained an idiot of the name lep who lay at his feet whenever he sat down to dinner and whom he had fed with his own hand persuaded that his mind when moved was capable of foretelling future events tycho carefully marked everything he said lest it should be supposed that it was done to no purpose longo montanus relates that when any person in the island was sick lep never when interrogated failed to predict whether the patient would live or die it is stated also in the letters of burmius both to gessendi and peter that when tycho was absent and his pupils became very noisy and merry in consequence of not expecting him soon home the idiot who was present exclaimed junches are laudate your master has arrived on another occasion when tycho had sent two of his pupils to copenhagen on business and had fixed the day of his their return lip surprised him on that day while he was at dinner by exclaiming behold your pupils are bathing in the sea tycho suspecting that they were shipwrecked sent some person on the observatory to look for their boat the messenger brought back word that he saw some persons wet on the shore and in distress with the boat upset at a great distance these stories have been given by gessendi and may be viewed as the specimens of the superstition of the age tycho left behind him a wife and six children but even in the time of gessendi nothing was known of their history excepting that tenengal who married one of the daughters gave up his scientific pursuits and having been admitted among the emperor's counsellors was employed in several of his embassies the instruments of tycho were purchased from his hires by the emperor for twenty two thousand crowns they were shut up in the house of curtius and were treated with such veneration that no astronomer not even kepler himself was permitted to see or to use them here they remind till the death of emperor matthias in sixteen nineteen when the troubles in bohemia took place when prague was taken by forces of the electoral palatine the instruments were carried off and some were destroyed and others converted to different purposes the great brass globe however was saved it was first carried to niesa the episcopal city of silesia and having been presented to the college of jesuits it was preserved in their museum till woodalric the son of christian king of denmark took niesa in 1632 the globe was recognized as having belonged to tycho and it was carried in triumph to denmark an inscription written upon it by longomonatanus and it was deposited with some pomp in the library of the academy of sciences after tycho left huyen the island was transferred to some of the danish nobility and the following brief but melancholy description of it was given by Ormius. there is in the island a field where uraniburg was the scientific antiquities of huyen have been more recently described by mr cox in his travels through denmark we landed says he on the southwest part in the small bay just below the place where a stream supplied by numerous pools and fish ponds falls into the sea we ascended the shore which was clothed with short herbage crossed the stream and passed over a gently waving surface gradually sloping towards the sea and walked a mile to a farmhouse standing in the middle of the island inhabited by mr shaw a swedish gentleman to whom the greater part of the island belongs he lives here in summer but in winter resides at lanskrona this dwelling is the same as existed in tycho brahe's time and was the farmhouse belonging to his estate a guide whom we obtained from mr shaw conducted us to the remains of tycho's mansion which are near the house and consist a little more than a mound of earth which enclosed the garden and two pits the sides of his mansion and observatory end of chapter ten read by lambda
Chapter Eleven of the Martyrs of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Martyrs of Science by David Brewster. Life of John Kepler. Chapter One. Kepler's birth in fifteen seventy one his family, and early education, the distresses and poverty of his family, he enters the monastic school of Marlborough, and is admitted into the University of Tübingen, where he distinguishes himself and takes his degrees. He is appointed professor of astronomy in Greek in 1594. His first speculations on the orbits of the planets, accounts of their progress and failure, his cosmographical mystery published he marries a widow in 1597 religious troubles at graz he retires from thence to hungary visits tycho at prague in 1600 returns to graz which he again quits to prague he is taken ill on the road is appointed tycho's assistant in 1601 succeeds tycho as imperial mathematician his works on the new star of 1604 singular specimen of it it is a remarkable circumstance in the history of science that astronomy should have been cultivated at the same time by three such distinguished men as tycho kepler and galileo while tycho in the fifty-fourth year of his age was observing the heavens at prague kepler only thirty years old was applying his wild genius to the determination of the orbit of mars and galileo at the age of thirty-six was about to direct the telescope to the unexplored regions of space the diversity of gifts which providence assigned to these three philosophers was no less remarkable tycho was destined to lay the foundation of the modern astronomy by a vast series of accurate observations made with the largest and finest instruments it was a proud lot of kepler to reduce the laws of planetary orbits from the observations of his predecessors while galileo enjoyed the more dazzling honour of discovering by the telescope new celestial bodies and new systems of the worlds john kepler the youngest of the illustrious band was born at the imperial city of Wiel in the duchy of wittemberg on the twenty first december fifteen seventy one his parents henry kepler and Catherine Guldenman were both of noble family, but had been reduced to indigence by their own bad conduct. Henry Kepler had long been in the service of the Duke of Wittenberg as a petty officer, and in that capacity had wasted his fortune. Upon setting out for the army, he left his wife in a state of pregnancy, and, at the end of seven months, she gave premature birth to John Kepler, who was, from this cause, a sickly child during the first years of his life being obliged to join the army in the netherlands his wife followed him into the field and left her son then five years old under the charge of his grandfather at limburg some time afterwards he was attacked with smallpox and having with difficulty recovered from the severe malady he went to school in fifteen seventy seven having become security for one of his friends who absconded from his creditors Henry Kepler was obliged to sell his house and all his property, and was driven to the necessity of keeping a tavern at Elmendingen. Owing to these misfortunes, young Kepler was taken from school about two years afterwards, and was obliged to perform the functions of a servant in his father's house. In 1585, he was again placed in the school of Elmendingen, but his father and mother, having both attacked with smallpox, and he himself having been seized with violent illness in 1585, his education had been much neglected, and he was prohibited from all mental application. In the year 1586, on the 26th of November, Kepler was admitted into the school at the monastery of Marlborough, which had been established at Reformation, and which was maintained at the expense of the Duke of Wittenberg as a preparatory seminary for the University of Tübingen, after remaining a year at the upper classes the scholars presented themselves for the examination at the college for the degree of bachelor and having received this they returned to the school with the title of veterans 
where they completed the usual course of study and being admitted as resident students at tubingen they took their degree of master in prosecuting this course of study kepler was sadly interrupted not only by periodical returns of his former complaints but by family quarrels of the most serious import these dissensions arising greatly from the perverseness of his mother drove his father to a foreign land where he soon died and his mother having quarrelled with all her relation the affairs of the family were involved in inextricable disorder notwithstanding these calamities kepler took his degree of bachelor on the fifteenth september fifteen eighty eight and his degree of master in august fifteen ninety one on which occasion he held the second place at the annual examination in his early studies kepler devoted himself with intense pleasure to philosophy in general but he entertained no peculiar affection for astronomy being well grounded in arithmetic and geometry he had no difficulty in making himself master of the geometrical and astronomical theorems which occurred in the course of his studies while attending the lectures of moslin professor of mathematics who had distinguished himself by an oration in favour of the copernican system kepler not only became a convert to the opinions of his master but defended them in a physical disputations of the students and even wrote an essay on the primary motion in order to prove that it was produced by the daily rotation of the earth in fifteen ninety four the astronomical chariot graz in styria fell vacant by the death of george Stadt, and according to kepler's own statement he was forced to accept this situation by the authority of his professional tutors who recommended him to the nobles of styria though kepler had little knowledge of the science and no passion for it whatever yet the nature of his office forced him to attend to astronomy and in the year fifteen ninety five when he enjoyed some leisure from his lectures he directed the whole energy of his mind to the three important topics of the number the size and the motion of the orbits of planets he first tried if the size of the planets orbits or the difference of their sizes had any regular proportion to each other finding no proof of this he inserted a new planet between mars and jupiter and another between venus and mercury which he supposed might be invisible from their smallness but even with these assumptions the distance of the planets exhibited no regular progression kepler next tried if these distances varied as the cosines of the quadrant and if the motion varied as the sun's the sine of ninety representing the motion of the sun and the sine of zero degree that it fixed stars but in this trial he was also disappointed having spent the whole summer in these fruitless speculations and praying constantly his maker for success he was accidentally drawing a diagram in his lecture room in july fifteen ninety five when he observed that the relation between the circle inscribed in a triangle and that inscribed round it and the ratio of these circles which was that of one to two appeared to his eyes to be identical to that of jupiter's and saturn's orbits hence he was led to compare the orbits of other planets circles described in pentagons and hexagons as this hypothesis was as inapplicable to the heavens as its predecessors kepler asked himself in despair what are plain figures to do with the solid orbits solid bodies ought to be used for solid orbits on the strength of this conceit he supposed that the distances of the planets were regulated by the size of the five regular solids described within one another the earth is the circle the measurer of all round it describe a dodecahedron the circle including this will be mars round mars describe a tetrahedron the circle including this will be jupiter describe a cube round jupiter the circle including this will be saturn then inscribe in the earth an icosahedron the circle described in it will be venus inscribe an octahedron in venus the circle inscribed in it will be mercury this discovery as he considered it harmonized in a very rude way with the measures of the planetary orbits given by copernicus but kepler was so enamoured with it that he ascribed the differences to errors of observation and declared that he would not renounce the glory of having made it for the whole electorate of saxony in his attempt to discover the relation between the periodic times of planets and their distances from the sun he was not more successful but as this relation had a real existence 
he made some slight approach to its determination these extraordinary researches which indicate the wildness and irregularity of kepler's genius were published in fifteen ninety six in a work entitled prodromes of cosmographical desolations containing the cosmographical mystery respecting the admirable proportion of the celestial orbits and the genuine and real causes of the number magnitude and the periods of the planets demonstrated by the five regular geometrical solids notwithstanding the speculative character of this volume it obtained for its author a high name among astronomers galileo and tycho whose opinions of it he requested spoke of it with some commendation the former praised the ingenuity and good faith which it displayed and tycho though he requested him to try to adapt something same nature to the tychonic system saw the speculative character of his mind and advised him to lay a solid foundation for his views by actual observation and then by ascending from these to strive to reach the cause of things in fifteen ninety two before kepler had quitted tubingen he was on the eye of entering into the married state though the foolish scheme was fortunately broken off yet he resumed it again in fifteen ninety six when he paid his address to barbara miller of mulek who was a widow for the second time though only twenty three years of age her parents however would not consent to the match till kepler proved his nobility and owing to the delay which arose from this circumstance the marriage did not take place till fifteen ninety seven the income which kepler derived from his professorship was very small and as his wife's fortune turned out to be much less than he had been led to expect he not only was annoyed with pecuniary difficulties but was involved in dispute with his wife's relations these evils were greatly increased by religious troubles which took place in styria the catholics of graz rose against the protestants and threatened to expel them from the city kepler who openly professed the protestant religion saw the risks which he was exposed and retired with his wife into hungary here he continued nearly a year during which he composed and transmitted to his friend zegant meyer at tubingen several small treatises on the magnet on the cause of the obliquity of the ecliptic and on the divine wisdom as shown in the creation all of which seem to have been lost in fifteen ninety nine kepler was recalled to graz by the states of styria and resumed his professorship but the city was still divided into two fractions and kepler who was a lover of peace found his situation very uncomfortable having learned from tycho that he had been able to determine more accurately than had been done the eccentricities of the orbits of the planets kepler was anxious to avail himself of these observations and set out on a visit to tycho at prague where he arrived in january sixteen hundred tycho received him with great kindness notwithstanding the part which he had taken against him along with Reimer, and he spent three or four months with him at benach it was then arranged that kepler should be appointed tycho's assistant in the observatory with a salary of hundred florins provided the states of styria should on the emperor's application allow him to be absent for two years and retain his salary kepler had returned to graz before this arrangement was completed and new troubles having broke out in the city he resigned his professorship dreading lest this step would frustrate his scheme of joining tycho he resolved to ask the patronage of the duke of wittemberg for the professorship of medicine at tubingen and with this view he corresponded with moslin and his other friends in that university when tycho heard of this plan he pressed him to abandon it and promised his best exertions to procure a permanent situation for him from the emperor encouraged by these promises kepler and his wife set off for prague but he was unfortunately attacked on the road with a cart and ague which lasted seven months and having exhausted the little money which he had along with him he was obliged to apply to tycho for a supply after his arrival at prague he was supported entirely by the bounty of his friend and he endeavoured to make some return for his kindness by attacking in the controversial pamphlet two of the scientific opponents of tycho kepler's total dependence on the generosity of his friend had made him suspicious of his sincerity he imagined that tycho had not freely communicated to him all his observations 
and that he had not been sufficiently liberal in supplying his wife with money in his absence while absent a second time from prague and influenced by these feelings he addressed a violent letter to tycho filled with reproaches on the plea of being occupied with his daughter's marriage tycho requested ericsson one of his assistants to reply to the kepler's letter and he did this with so much effort that kepler saw his mistake and in the noblest and most generous manner supplicated the forgiveness of his friend tycho exhibited the same good feeling and the kindness of hoffmann president of the states of styria completed the reconciliation of the two astronomers on his return to prague in sixteen o one he was presented by tycho to the emperor who conferred upon him the title of the imperial mathematician on the condition that he would assist tycho in his calculations the connection was peculiarly valuable to kepler as the observations of his colleague were the only ones made in the world which could enable him to carry out his own theoretical inquiries these two astronomers now undertook to compute from tycho's observations a new set of astronomical tables to be called the rudolphin tables in the honour of the emperor this scheme flattered the vanity of their master and he pledged himself to pay all the expenses of the work longo montanus tycho's principal assistant took upon himself the labour of arranging and discussing the observations on the stars while kepler devoted himself to the more congenial task of examining those on the planet mars with which tycho was at that time particularly occupied the appointment of longo montanus to a professorship in denmark and the death of tycho in october sixteen o one put a stop to these important schemes kepler succeeded tycho as principal mathematician to the emperor and was provided with a handsome salary and which was partly charged on the imperial treasury and partly on the states of silesia and the first instalment of which was to be paid in march sixteen o two the generosity of the emperor did not fail to excite the jealousy of ignorant individuals who were not aware of the value of science of the state but the increasing fame of kepler and the valuable works which he published soon silenced their opposition in september sixteen o four astronomers were surprised with the appearance of a new star in the foot of serpentarius it was not seen before twenty ninth of september and moslin informs us that on the account of the clouds he did not obtain a good view of it till the sixth of october like that of fifteen seventy two it at first surpassed jupiter in brightness and rivalled even venus but it afterwards became as small as regulus and as dull as saturn and disappeared at the end of a few months it constantly changed its colour and was at first warny then yellow then purple and red and often white at great altitudes it had no parallax and therefore was a fixed star kepler wrote a short account on this remarkable body and maintained its superiority to that of fifteen seventy two as this last came in an ordinary year while the other appeared in the year of the fiery trigon or that in which saturn jupiter and mars are in the three fiery signs aries leo and sagittarius an event which occurs only every eight hundred years after discussing a great variety of topics but little connected with the subject and in a style of absurd jocularity he attacks the opinions of epicureans that the star was a fortuitous concourse of atoms in the following remarkable paragraph which is a good specimen of the work when i was a youth with plenty of idle time on my hands i was much taken with the vanity of which some grown men are not ashamed of making anagrams by transposing the letters of my name written in latin out of johannes keplerus came serpens in aculeo a serpent in a sting but not being satisfied with the meaning of these words and being unable to make another i trusted the thing to chance and taking out of a pack of playing cards as many as there were letters in my name i wrote upon each and began to shuffle them and at each shuffle to read them in the order they came to see if any meaning came out of it now may all the epicurean gods and goddesses confound their same chance which although i have spent a good deal of time over it never showed anything like sense even from a distance so i gave my cards to epicurean eternity to be carried away into infinity and it is said 
they are still flying about there in the utmost confusion among the atoms and have never yet come to any meaning i will tell these disputants my opponents not my own opinion but my wife's yesterday when weary with writing and my mind quite dusty with considering these atoms i was called to supper and a salad i asked for was set before me it seems then said i aloud that if pewter dishes leaves of lettuce grains of salt drops of water vinegar and oil and slices of egg had been flying about in the air from all eternity it might at last happen by chance that there would come a salad yes says my wife but not so nice and well dressed as this of mine is end of chapter 11 read by lambda chapter 12 of the martyrs of science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the martyrs of science by david brewster life of john kepler chapter 2 kepler's pecuniary embarrassments his enquiries respecting the law of refraction his supplement to vitellio his researches on vision his treatise on dioptrics his commentaries on mars he discovers that the orbit of mars is an ellipse with the sun in one focus and extends this discovery to all other planets he establishes the two first laws of physical astronomy his family distresses death of his wife he is appointed professor of mathematics at linz his method of choosing a second wife her character as given by himself origin of his treatise on gauging he goes to ratisbon to give his opinion to the diet on the change of style he refuses the mathematical chair at bologna although kepler now felt one of the most honorable situations to which philosopher could aspire and possessed a large salary fitted to supply his most reasonable wants yet as the imperial treasury was drained by the demands of an expensive war his salary was always in arrear owing to this cause he was constantly involved in pecuniary difficulties and as he himself described his situation he was perpetually begging his bread from the emperor at prague his increasing family rendered the want of money still more distressing and he was driven to the painful alternative of drawing his income from casting nativities from the same cause he was obliged to abandon his plan of publishing rudolphine tables and to devote himself to works of less expensive kind and which were more likely to yield some pecuniary advantages in spite of these embarrassments and the occupation of his time in the practice of astrology kepler found leisure for his favorite pursuits no adverse circumstances were capable of extinguishing his scientific ardor and whenever he directed his vigorous mind to the investigation of phenomena he never failed to obtain interesting and original results since the death of tycho his attention had been much occupied with the subject of refraction and vision and in 1606 he published the result of his researches in a work entitled a supplement to vitellio in which the optical part of astronomy is treated but chiefly on the artificial observation and estimation of diameters and of the eclipses of the sun and moon astronomers had long been perplexed with the refraction of the atmosphere and so little was known of the general subject as well as of this branch of it that tycho believed the refraction of the atmosphere to cease at 45 degree of altitude even at the beginning of the second century claudius ptolemy of alexandria had unraveled his principal mysteries and had given in his optics a theory of astronomical refraction more complete than that of any astronomer before the time of cassini but the manuscripts had unfortunately been mislaid and halazan and vitellio and kepler were obliged to take up the subject from its commencement ptolemy had not only determined that the refraction of the atmosphere had gradually increased from zenith to the horizon but he had measured with singular accuracy the angles of refraction for water and glass from a perpendicular incidence to a horizontal one 
Kepler treated this branch of science in his own peculiar way, hunting down, as he expressed it, every hypothesis which his fertile imagination had successively presented to him. In his various attempts to discover the laws of refraction, or a measure of it, as varying with the density of the body and the angle of incidence of the light, he was nearer the goal in his first speculation than in any of the rest, and he seems to have failed in the consequence of his not separating the question as it is related to density from a question as it related to incidence. I did not leave untried, says he, whether my assuming a horizontal refraction according to the density of the medium, the rest would correspond to the signs of the distances from the vertical direction, but calculation proved that it was not so, and indeed there was no occasion to have tried it, for thus the refraction would increase according to the same law in all mediums, which is contradicted by experiment. Although completely foiled in his search after the law of refraction, which was subsequently discovered by Willebrod Snell, and some time afterwards by James Gregory, he was singularly successful in his inquiries respecting vision. Regarding the eye as analogous in its structure with the camera obscura of Baptista Porta, he discovered that the images of external objects were painted in an inverted position on the retina, by the union of the pencil of rays which issued from every point of the object. He ascribed an erect vision to an operation of the mind, by which it traces the rays back to the pupil, where they cross one another, and thus refers the lower parts of the image to the higher parts of the object. He also explained the cause of long-sighted and short-sighted vision, and showed how convex and concave lenses enable those who possess these peculiarities of vision to see distinctly, by accurately converging the pencil of rays to a focus on the retina. Kepler likewise observed the power of accommodating the eye to a different distances, and he ascribed it to the contraction of the ciliary processes, which drew the sides of the eyeball towards the crystalline lens, and thus elongated the eye so as to produce an adjustment of it for near objects. Kepler wisely declined to inquire into the way in which the mind perceives the image painted on the retina, and he blames Vitellio for attempting to determine a question which he considered as not belonging to optics. The work of Kepler, now under consideration, contains the method of calculating eclipses, which is now in use at the present day. The only other optical treatise written by Kepler was his Dioptrics, with an appendix on the use of optics in philosophy. This admirable work, which laid the foundation of the science, was published in Augsburg in 1611, and reprinted at London in 1653, although Moralesis had made some slight progress in studying the passage of light through different media, yet it was to Kepler that we owe the methods of tracing the progress of rays through transparent bodies with convex and concave surfaces, and of determining the foci of lenses, and of the relative positions of the images which they form, and the objects from which the rays proceed. He was thus led to explain the rational of the telescope, and to invent the astronomical telescope, which consists of two convex lenses, by which objects are inverted. Kepler also discovered the important fact that spherical surfaces were not capable of converging rays to a single focus, and he conjectured what Tikarthi afterwards proved, that this property might be possessed by lenses having the figure of some of the sections of the cone. The total reflection of light at the second surface of bodies was likewise studied by Kepler, and he determined that, that the total reflection commenced when this angle of incidence was equal to the angle of refraction, which correspond to an incidence of 90. Two years before the publication of his dioptrics, like in 1609, Kepler had given to the world his great work entitled The New Astronomy, or Commentaries on the Motions of Mars. The discoveries which this volume records from the basis of physical astronomy, the inquiries by which he was led to them, began in that memorable year 1601 when he became the colleague and assistant of tycho the powers of original genius were then for the first time associated with the inventive skill and patient observation and though the astronomical data provided by tycho were sure of finding their application in some future age yet without them kepler's speculations would have been in vain and the laws which they enabled them to determine would have adorned the history of another century Having tried in vain to represent the motion of Mars by an uniform motion in a circular orbit, and by cycles and epicycles 
with which copernicus had endeavoured to explain the planetary inequalities kepler was led after many fruitless speculations to suppose the orbit of the planet to be oval and from his knowledge of the conic sections he afterwards determined it to be an ellipse with the sun placed in one of its foci he then ascertained the dimensions of the orbit and by comparison of the times employed by the planet to complete a whole revolution or any part of one he discovered that the time in which mars describes any arches of his elliptic orbit were always to one another as the areas contained by the lines drawn from the focus or the centre of the sun to the extremities of the respective arches or in other words the radius vector or the line joining the sun and mars describe equal areas in equal times by examining the inequalities of the other planets he found that they all moved in elliptic orbits and that the radius vector of each described areas proportional to the times these two great results were known by the name of the first and second laws of kepler the third law or that which relates the connection between the periodic times and the distances of the planets were not discovered till a later period of his life when kepler presented to rudolph the volume which contained these fine discoveries he reminded him jocularly of his requiring the sinews of war to make similar attacks upon the other planets the emperor however had made formidable enemies then jupiter and saturn and from the treasury which war had exhausted he found it difficult to supply the wants of science while kepler was thus involved in the miseries of poverty misfortunes of every kind filled up the cup of his adversity his wife who had long been the victim of low spirits was seized towards the end of sixteen ten with a fever epilepsy and phrenitis and before she had completely recovered all his three children were simultaneously attacked with smallpox his favourite son fell a victim to this malady and at the same time prague was partially occupied by the troops of leopold the part of the city where kepler resided was harnessed by bohemian levies and to crown this list of evils the austrian troops introduced the plague into the city sometimes afterwards kepler set out for austria with the view of obtaining professorship of mathematics at linz which was now vacant but upon his return in june he found his wife in a decline brought on by grief for the loss of her son and she was some time afterwards seized with an infectious fever of which she died the emperor rudolph was unwilling to allow kepler to quit prague he encouraged him with hopes that the arrears of his salary would be paid from saxony but these hopes were fallacious and it was not till the death of rudolph in sixteen twelve that kepler was freed from these distressing embarrassments on the accession of matthias rudolph's brother kepler was reappointed imperial mathematician and was allowed to accept the professorship at lens his family now consisted of two children a daughter susanna born in sixteen o two and a son louis born in sixteen o seven his own time was so completely occupied by his new professorial duties as well as by his private studies that he found it necessary to seek another parent for his children for this purpose he gave a commission to his friends to look out for him a suitable wife and in a long and jocular letter to baron standalfor he has given an amusing account of different negotiations which preceded his marriage the substance of this letter is so well known by mr drinkwater bethune that we shall follow his account of it the first of the eleven ladies among whom his inclinations wavered was a widow an intimate friend of his first wife and who on many accounts appeared a most eligible match at first says kepler she seemed favourably inclined to the proposal it is certain that she took time to consider it but at last she very quietly excused herself it must have been from the recollection of this lady's good qualities that kepler was induced to make his offer for we learn rather unexpectedly after being informed of her decision that when he soon afterwards paid his respects to her it was the first time that he had seen her during the last six years and he found to his great relief that there was no single pleasing part about her the truth seems to be that he was netted by her answer and he is at greater pains than appears necessary considering this last discovery to determine why she could not accept his offered hand among other reasons he suggested her children among whom were two marriageable daughters and it is diverting afterwards to find them also in the catalogue
which kepler appeared to be making of all his female acquaintances of the other ladies one was too old another in bad health another too proud of her birth and quarterings a fourth had learned nothing but shoey accomplishments not at all suitable to the sort of life she would have to lead with me another grew impatient and married a more decided admirer whilst he was hesitating the mischief says he in all these attachments was that whilst i was delaying comparing and balancing conflicting reasons every day saw me inflamed with a new passion by the time he reached eighth he found his match in this respect fortune at length has avenged herself on my doubtful inclinations at first she was quite complying and her friends also presently whether she did or did not consent not only i but she herself did not know after the lapse of a few days came a renewed promise which however had to be confirmed a third time and four days after that she again repeated her confirmation and begged to be excused from it upon this i gave her up and this time all my counsellors were of one opinion this was the longest courtship in the list having lasted three whole months and quite disheartened by its bad success kepler's next attempt was a more timid complexion his advances to number nine were made by confiding to her the whole story of his recent disappointment prudently determining to be guided in his behaviour by observing whether the treatment he had experienced met with a proper degree of sympathy apparently the experiment did not succeed and almost reduced to despair kepler betook himself to the advice of a friend who had for some time complained that she was not consulted in this difficult negotiation when she produced number ten the first visit was paid the report upon her was follows she has undoubtedly a good fortune is of good family and of economical habits but her physiognomy is most horribly ugly she would be starred at in the streets not to mention the striking disproportion in her figures i am lank lean and spare she is short and thick in a family notorious of fullness she is considered superfluously fat the only objection to number eleven seems to have been her excessive youth and when this treaty was broken off on that account kepler turned his back upon all his advisers and chose for himself one who had figured as number five in the list to whom he professes to have felt attached throughout but from whom the representation of his friends had hitherto detained him probably on account of her humble station the following is kepler's summary of her character her name is susanna the daughter of john ruthinger and barbara citizens of the town of eferdingen the father was by trade a cabinet maker but both her parents are dead she has received an education well worth the largest dowry by favour of the lady of strahenberg the strictness of whose household is famous throughout the province her person and manners are suitable to mine no pride no extravagance she can bear to work she has a tolerable knowledge how to manage a family middle-aged and of a disposition and capability to acquire what she still wants her i shall marry by the favour of the noble baron of strandberg at twelve o'clock on the thirtieth of next october with all efforting and assembled to meet us and we shall eat the marriage dinner at morris's at the golden lion kepler's marriage seems to have taken place at the time here mentioned for in his book on gauging published at lens in sixteen fifteen he informs us that he took home his new wife in november on which occasion he found it necessary to stock his cellar with a few casks of wine when the wine merchant came to measure the casks kepler objected to his method as he made no allowance for the different sizes of the bulging parts of the cask from this accident kepler was led to study the subject of gauging and to write the book which we have mentioned and which contains the earliest specimens of the modern analysis about this period kepler was summoned to the diet of ratisbon to give his opinion on the reformation of the calendar and he published a short essay on the subject but though the government did not scruple to avail themselves of his services yet his pension was allowed to fall in arrear and in order to support his family he was obliged to publish an almanac suited to the taste of the age in order says he to defray the expense of the ephemeris for two years i have been obliged to compile a vial of prophesying almanac 
which is scarcely more respectable than begging unless from its saving the emperor's credit who abandons me entirely and would suffer me to perish with hunger although kepler's residence at lens was rendered uncomfortable by the roman catholics who had excommunicated him on the account of his refusing to subscribe to some opinions respecting the ubiquity of our saviour or as others maintain on account of some opinions which he had expressed respecting transubstantiation yet he refused in sixteen seventeen to accept an invitation to fill the mathematical chair at bologna the prospect of his fortune being bettered by such a change could not reconcile him to live in a country where his freedom of speech and manners might expose him to suspicion and he accordingly declined in the most respectful manner the offer which was made to him End of chapter 12 Read by Lambda Chapter 13 of The Martyrs of Science This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Martyrs of Science by David Brewster Life of John Kepler Chapter 3 Kepler's Continued Embarrassments Death of Matthias Liberality of Ferdinand Kepler's Harmonies of the World The Epitome of the Copernican Astronomy It is Prohibited by the Inquisition Sir Henry Wotton, the British Ambassador, invites Kepler to England He declines the invitation Neglect of genius by the English government. Trial of Kepler's mother. Her final acquittal. And death at the age of 75. The states of Styria burn publicly Kepler's calendar. He receives his arrears of salary from Ferdinand. The Rudolphin tables published in 1628. He receives a gold chain from the Grand Duke of Tuscany. He is patronized by the Duke of Friedland. He removes to Sagan in Silesia. Is appointed professor of mathematics at Rostock. Goes to Ratisbon to receive his arrears. His death, funeral, and epitaph. Monument erected to his memory in 1803. His family. His posthumous volume entitled The Dream or Lunar Astronomy. Kepler was kept in a state of constant anxiety from the delay in the government to pay up the arrears of his pension, while their repeated promises prevented him from accepting of other employments. He had hoped that the affair of Bologna's chair would rouse the imperial treasury to a sense of its duty and enable him to publish the Rudolphin tables, that great work which he owed to the memory both of Tycho and of Rudolph. But though he was disappointed in this expectation, an event now occurred which at least held out the prospect of a favourable change in his circumstances. The Emperor Matthias died in 1619 and was succeeded by Ferdinand III, who not only continued him in the situation of his principal mathematician with his former pension, but promised to pay up the arrears of it and to furnish the means of publishing the Rudolphin tables. The year 1619, so favourable to Kepler's prospects in life, was distinguished also by the publication, at Linz, one of his most remarkable productions, entitled The Harmonies of the World. It is dedicated to James I of England, and will be forever memorable in the history of science, as containing the celebrated law that the squares of the periodic times of the planets are to one another as the cubes of their distances. This singular volume, which is marked with all the peculiarities which distinguish his cosmographical mystery, is divided into five books. The first two books are principally geometrical, and relate to regular polygons inscribed in a circle. The third book is a treatise on music, in which musical proportions are derived from figures. The fourth book is astrological, and treats the harmony of rays emanating on the earth from the heavenly bodies, and on their influence over the sublunary or human soul. The fifth book is astronomical and metaphysical and treats of the exquisite harmonies of the celestial motions and of the celebrated third law of the universe which we have already referred to. This law, 
as he himself informs us, first entered his mind on the 8th March 1618, but having made an erroneous calculation, he was obliged to reject it. He resumed the subject on 15th May, and having discovered his former error, he recognized with transport the absolute truth of a principle which for seventeen years had been the object of his incessant labours. The delight which this grand discovery gave him had no bounds. Nothing holds me, says he. I will indulge in my sacred fury. I will triumph over mankind by the honest confession that I have stolen the golden vases of the Egyptians to build up a tabernacle for my god far away from the confines of Egypt. If you forgive me, I rejoice. If you are angry, I can bear it. The die is cast. The book is written, to be read either now or by posterity. I care not which. It may well wait a century for a reader, as God has waited six thousand years for an observer. About the same time, in 1618, Kepler published, at Linz, the three first books of his Epitome of Copernican Astronomy, on which the fourth was published at the same place in 1622, and the fifth, sixth, and seventh at Frankfurt in the same year. This interesting book is a kind of summary of all his astronomical views, drawn up in the form of a dialogue for the perusal of general readers. Immediately after its publication, it was placed by Inquisition in the list of prohibited books, and the moment Kepler learned this from his correspondent Remus, he was thrown into a great alarm and requested from him some information respecting the terms and consequences of censure which was then pronounced against him he was afraid that it might compromise his personal safety if he went to italy that he would be compelled to retract his opinions that the censure might extend to austria that the sale of his work would be ruined and that he must either abandon his country or his opinions the reply of his friend remus calmed his agitated mind by explaining to him the true nature of the prohibition, and he concluded his letter with a piece of seasonable exhortation. There is no ground for your alarm either in Italy or in Austria. Only keep yourself within bounds, and put a guard upon your own passions. In the year 1620, Sir Henry Wotton, the English ambassador at Venice, paid a visit to Kepler on his way through Germany. It does not appear whether or not this visit was paid at the desire of James I, to whom Kepler had dedicated one of his works, but from the nature of the communication which was made to him by the ambassador, there are strong reasons to think that this was the case. Sir Henry Wotton urged Kepler to take up his residence in England, where he could assure him of a welcome and an honourable reception. But, notwithstanding the pecuniary difficulties in which he was then involved, he did not accept of the invitation. In referring to this offer in one of his letters, written a year after it was made, he thus balances the difficulties of the question. The fires of civil war, says he, are raging in Germany. Shall I then cross the sea whither Wotton invites me? I, a German, lover of firm land, who dread the confinement of an island, who presage its dangers, and must drag along with me my little wife and flock of children? As Kepler seems to have entertained no doubt of his being well provided for in England, it is the more probable that the British sovereign had made him a distinct offer through his ambassador. A welcome and an honourable reception, in the ordinary sense of terms, could not have supplied the wants of a starving astronomer, who was called upon to renounce a large, though an ill-paid salary in his native land, and kepler had experienced too deeply the faithlessness of royal pledges to trust his fortune to so vague an assurance as that which is implied in the language of english ambassador during the two centuries which have elapsed since the invitation was given to kepler there has been no reign during which the most illustrious foreigner could hope for pecuniary support either from the sovereign or the government of england what english science has never been able to command for her indigenous talent, was not likely to be preferred to foreign merit. The generous hearts of individual Englishmen, indeed, are always open to claims of intellectual pre-eminence, and were ready to welcome the stranger whom it adorns. But, through the frozen life-blood of British minister, such sympathies have seldom vibrated. And, 
amid the struggles of faction and the anxiety of personal and family ambition he was turned a deaf ear to the demands of genius whether she appeared in the humble posture of a suppliant or the prouder attitude of a national benefactor if the imperial mathematician therefore had no other assurance of a comfortable home in england than that of sir henry wotton he acted a wise part in distrusting it and we rejoice that the sacred name of kepler was thus withheld from the long list of distinguished characters whom england has starved and dishonoured in the year sixteen twenty kepler was exposed to a severe calamity which continued to harass him for some time his mother catherine kepler to whose peculiarities of temper we were already referred was arrested on the fifth april upon a charge of a serious nature one of her friends having some years before suffered a miscarriage was subsequently attacked with violent headaches and catherine was charged with having administered poison to her friend this accusation was indignantly repelled and a young doctor of law whom she consulted advised her to raise an action against her calumniator from professional reasons or probably pecuniary ones the zealous practitioner continued to delay the lawsuit for five years the judge who tried it happened to be displaced and was succeeded by another who had a personal quarrel with the prosecutor the defender who was aware of this favourable change in her case became the accuser and in july sixteen twenty catherine kepler was sent to prison and condemned to torture the moment this event reached the ears of her son he quitted Linz and arrived in the time to save her from punishment he found that the evidence upon which she was condemned had no other foundation but her own intemperate conduct and though his interference was successful yet she was not finally released from the prison till the fourth november sixteen twenty one convinced of her innocence this bold woman now in the seventy-ninth year of her age raised a new action for damages against her opponent but her death in april sixteen twenty two put an end to her own miseries as well as to the anxiety of her son among the virtues of this singular woman we must number that of generosity moslin the old perceptor of kepler had generously declined any compensation for his instructions kepler never forgot this act of kindness and in the midst of his poverty he found means to send to moslin a handsome silver cup in the token of his gratitude in acknowledging this gift moslin remarks your mother had taken it into her head that you owed me two hundred florins and had brought fifteen florins and a chandelier towards reducing the debt which i advised her to send to you i asked her to stay to dinner which she refused however she handselled your cup and as you know she is of a thirsty temperament in the same year in which his mother was arrested the states of styria ordered all the copies of the calendar for sixteen twenty four to be publicly burnt there does not seem to be any reason for supposing that this insult proceeded from his old enemies the catholics they would no doubt take an active share in carrying into effect but it would appear that his former patrons were affronted at kepler's giving the precedence in his title page to the states of upper ends where he then resided above the states of styria in sixteen twenty two the emperor ferdinand notwithstanding his own pecuniary difficulties ordered the whole of kepler's arrears to be paid even those which had been due by rudolph and matthias and so great was his anxiety to have rudolphine tables published that he supplied the means for their immediate completion new difficulties however sprung up to retard still longer the appearance of this most important work the wars of the reformation which were then agitating the whole of germany interfered with every peaceful pursuit the library of kepler was sealed up by the order of jesuits and it was only his position as imperial mathematician that saved him from personal inconvenience a popular insurrection followed in the train of these disasters the presentary block-headed lens the place of kepler's residence and it was not till the year sixteen twenty seven as the title page bears or sixteen twenty eight as kepler elsewhere states that these celebrated tables were given to the world 
the rudolphin tables were published at ulm in one volume folio these tables were calculated by kepler from the observations of tycho and are founded on his own great discovery of the ellipticity of the planetary orbits the first and third parts of the work contain logarithmic and other auxiliary tables for the purpose of facilitating astronomical calculations the second part contains tables of the sun moon and planets and the fourth a catalogue of thousand stars as determined by tycho a nautical map is prefixed to some copies of the tables and the description of it contains the first notice of the method of determining the longitude by means of occultations a short time after the publication of these tables the grand duke of tuscany instigated no doubt by galileo sent kepler a gold chain in testimony of his approbation to the great service which he had rendered to astronomy about this time albert wallenstein duke of friedland a great patron of astrology and one of the most distinguished men of the age made the most munificent offers to kepler and invited him to take up his residence at sagan in silesia the religious dissensions which agitated Linz, the love of tranquillity which kepler had so little enjoyed and the publication of his great work induced him to accept of this offer he accordingly removed his family from Linz to ratisbon in 1629 and he himself set for prague with the double object of presenting the rudolphin tables to the emperor and of soliciting his permission to go into the service of the duke of friedland the emperor did not hesitate to grant this request and would have gladly transferred kepler's arrears as well as himself to the charge of a foreign prince kepler accordingly set out with his wife and family for sagan where he arrived in sixteen twenty nine the duke albert treated him with liberality and distinction he supplied him with an assistant for his calculations and also with a printing press and by his influence with the duke of melkenburg he obtained for him a professorship in the university of rostock in this remote situation kepler found it extremely difficult to obtain a payment for the imperial pension which he still retained the arrears had accumulated to eight thousand crowns and he resolved to go to the imperial assembly at ratisbon to make a final effort to obtain them his attempts however were fruitless the vexation which this occasioned and the great fatigue which he had undergone threw him into a violent fever which is said to have been one of the cold and to have been accompanied with an imposthume in his brain occasioned by too much study this disease baffled the skill of physicians and carried him off on the fifth november o s sixteen thirty in the sixtieth year of his age the remains of this great man were interred in st peter's churchyard at ratisbon and the following inscription embodying an epitaph which had been written for himself was engraven on his tombstone enoch quisit ver nobilissimus doctissimus e celebrimus dom johannes keplerus trium imperatorum rudolphi second mathie e ferdinandi second per annos trantex antia vero procerum styrie ab anno fifteen ninety four usque sixteen hundred postia quaque astria corum ordinum ab anno sixteen twelve usque ad annum sixteen twenty eight mathematius toti orbi christiani per monumenta publica cognitus ab omnibus doctis inter principe astronomio numeratus qui properia manu assinatum posse reliqui tale effitafiam menesus eram quelos nunc tere mertior umbras mens quelitis erat corporis umbra jacet in christopi obit anno salutis sixteen thirty t cinqua nombris aetiti sue sexagesimo the monument was not long preserved it was destroyed during the wars which desolated germany and no attempt was made till seventeen eighty six to mark with honour the spot which contained such venerable remains this attempt however failed and it was not till eighteen o three that this great duty was paid to the memory of kepler by the prince bishop of constance who erected a handsome monumental temple near the place of his interment 
and in the botanical garden of the city the temple is surmounted by a spear and in the centre is a bust of kepler in carrara marble kepler left behind him a wife and seven children two by his first wife susanna and louise and three sons and two daughters by his second wife like sebald cordelia friedman hildebert and anna maria the eldest of these susanna was married a few months before her father's death to jacob bashius his pupil who was educated as a physician and his son louis died in sixteen sixty three while practising medicine at konigsberg the children by his second wife have said to have died young they were left in very narrow circumstances and though twenty four thousand florins were due to kepler by the emperor yet only a part of the sum was received by susanna in consequence of her refusing to give up tycho's observations till the debt was paid kepler composed a little work entitled the dream of john kepler or lunar astronomy the object of which was to describe the phenomena seen from the moon but he died while he and bashius were engaged in its publication and bashius having resumed the task died also before its completion louis kepler dreaded to meddle with a work which had proved so fatal to his father and his brother-in-law but this superstitious feeling was overcome and the work was published at frankfurt in sixteen thirty six end of chapter thirteen read by lambda chapter fourteen of the martyrs of science this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the martyrs of science by david brewster life of john kepler chapter four number of kepler's published works his numerous manuscripts in twenty-two folio volumes purchased by hevelius and afterwards by hansch who publishes kepler's life and correspondence at the expense of charles fourth the history of the rest of his manuscripts which are deposited in the library of the academy of sciences at st petersburg general character of kepler his candour in acknowledging his errors his moral and religious character his astrological writings and opinions considered his character as an astronomer and a philosopher the splendour of his discoveries account of his methods of investigating truth although the labours of kepler were frequently interrupted by severe and long continued indisposition as well as by the pecuniary embarrassments in which he was constantly involved yet the ardour and the power of his mind enabled him to surmount all the difficulties of his position not only did he bring to a successful completion the leading enquiries which he had begun but he found leisure for composing an immense number of works more or less connected with the subject of his studies between fifteen ninety four when he published his calendar at Graz, and sixteen thirty the year of his death he published no fewer than thirty-three separate works and he left behind him twenty-two volumes of manuscripts seven of which contain his epistolary correspondence the celebrated astronomer hevelius who was a contemporary of louis kepler purchased all these manuscripts from kepler's representatives at the death of hevelius they were bought by monsieur gottlieb hansch a zealous mathematician who was desirous of giving them to the world for this purpose he issued a prospectus in seventeen fourteen for publishing them by subscription in twenty-two volumes folio but this plan having failed he was introduced to charles fourth who liberally obtained for him thousand ducats to defray the expense of publication and an annual pension of three hundred florins with such encouragement hansch published in seventeen eighteen in one volume folio the correspondence of kepler entitled epistolae ad joninum keplerum insertis ad essedum responsionibus keplerinis kit kit hactenus repiri poturunt opus nuvum ecum jo keplerivita the expense of this volume unfortunately exhausted the thousand ducats which had been granted by the emperor and instead of being able to publish the rest of the manuscripts hansch was under the necessity of pledging them for eight hundred and twenty eight florins 
under these difficulties he addressed himself in vain to the celebrated wolfius to the royal society of london and to other bodies that were likely to interest themselves in such a subject in seventeen sixty one when monsieur de Moore of nuremberg was in london he made great exertions to obtain the manuscripts and dr bradley is said to have been on the eve of purchasing them the competition probably raised the demands of the proprietor in whose hands they continued for many years in seventeen seventy three they were offered for four thousand francs and some time afterwards monsieur de Moore purchased them for the imperial academy of sciences at st petersburg in whose library they still remain euler lexel and Kraft undertook the task of examining them and selecting those that were best fitted for publication but we believe that no steps have yet been taken for executing this task nor are we aware that science would derive any advantages from its completion although in drawing his own character kepler describes himself as troublesome and choleric in politics and domestic matters yet the general events of his life indicate a more peaceful disposition than might have been expected from the peculiarities of his mind and the ardour of his temperament on one occasion indeed he wrote a violent and reproachful letter to tycho who had given him no just ground of offence but the state of kepler's health at that moment and the necessitous circumstances in which he had been placed present some palliation of his conduct but independent of his apology his subsequent conduct was so truly noble to reconcile even tycho to his penitent friend kepler quickly saw the error he committed he lamented it with genuine contrition and was anxious to remove any unfavourable impression which he might have given of his friend by the most public confession of his error and by the warmest acknowledgments of the kindness of tycho in his relation with the scientific men of his own times kepler conducted himself with that candour and love of truth which should always distinguish the philosopher he was never actuated by any mean jealousy of his rivals he never scrupled to acknowledge their high merits and when the discoveries made by the telescope established beyond a doubt the error of some of kepler's views he willingly avowed his mistake and never joined in the opposition which was made by many of his friends to the discoveries of galileo a striking example of this was exhibited in a reference to his supposed discovery of mercury on sun's disk in the year sixteen o seven kepler observed upon the face of the sun a dark spot which he mistook for mercury but the day proving cloudy he had not the means of determining by subsequent observations whether or not his opinion was well founded as spots on the sun were at the time unknown kepler did not hesitate to publish the fact in sixteen o seven in his mercurius in sole visus but when galileo a few years afterwards discovered a great number of similar spots with a telescope kepler retracted his opinions and acknowledged that galileo's discovery afforded an explanation also of many similar observations in old writers which he had found it difficult to reconcile with the actual motions of mercury kepler was not one of those cold-hearted men who though continually occupied in the study of the material world and ambitious of the distinction which a successful examination of it confers are yet insensible to the goodness and greatness of the being who made it and sustains it his mind was cast in a better mould the magnificence and harmony of the divine works excited in him not only admiration but love he felt his own humility the farther he was allowed to penetrate into the mysteries of the universe and sensible of the incompetency of his unaided powers for such transcendent researches and recognizing himself as but the instrument which the almighty employed to make known his wonders he never entered upon his inquiries without praying for assistance from above this frame of mind was by no means inconsistent with that high spirit of delight and triumph with which kepler surveyed his discoveries he was the unpretending ovation of success not the ostentatious triumph of ambition and if a noble pride did occasionally mingle itself with his feelings it was the pride of being the chosen messenger of physical truth not that of being the favoured possessor of superior genius with such a frame of mind kepler was necessarily a christian the afflictions with which he beset confirmed his faith and brightened his hopes he bore them in all their variety and severity with a christian patience and though he knew that his world was to be a theatre of his intellectual glory yet he felt that his rest and his reward could be found only in another it is difficult to form any intelligible idea of the nature and extent of kepler's astrological opinions 
and of the degree of credit which he himself placed in the opinions that he did avow in his principles of astrology published in sixteen o two and in other works he rails against the vanity and worthlessness of the ordinary astrology he regards those who professed it as knaves and charlatans and maintains that the planets and stars exercise no influence whatever over human affairs he conceives however that certain harmonious configurations of suitable planets like the spur to a horse or a speech to an audience have the power of exciting the minds of men to certain general actions or impulses so that the only effect of the configurations is to operate along with the vital soul in producing results which could not otherwise have taken place as an example of this he states that those who are born when many aspects of the planets occur generally turn out busy and industrious whether they have occupied in amassing wealth managing public affairs or prosecuting scientific studies kepler himself was born under triple configuration and hence in his opinion his ardour and activity in study and he informs us that he knew a lady born under nearly the same configuration who not only makes no progress in literature but who troubles her whole family and occasions deplorable misery of herself this excitement of faculties of sublunary natures as he expresses it by the colours and aspects and conjunctions of the planet is regarded by kepler as a fact which he deduced from observation and which has compelled his unwilling belief i have been driven to this says he not by studying or admiring plato but singly and solely by observing seasons and noting the aspects by which they are produced i have seen the state of the atmosphere almost uniformly distributed as soon as the planets are in conjunction or in other configurations so celebrated among astrologers i have noticed its tranquil state either when there are none or few such aspects and when they are transitory or of short duration had kepler been able to examine these hasty and erroneous deductions by long continued observation he would have soon found that the coincidence which he did observe was merely accidental and he would have cheerfully acknowledged it speculations of this kind however are from their very nature less subject to rigorous scrutiny and a long series of observations is necessary either to establish or to overturn them the industry of modern observers has now supplied this defect and there is no point in science more certain than that of sun moon and planets do not exercise any influence on the general state of our atmosphere the philosophers in kepler's days who had studied the phenomena of the tides without having any idea of their cause and who observed that they are clearly related to the daily motions of the two great luminaries may be excused for the extravagance of their belief in supposing that the planets exercised other influences over sublunary nature although kepler in his commentaries on mars had considered it probable that the waters of our oceans are attracted by the moon as i in his by lodestone yet this opinion seems to have been a very transient one as he long afterwards in a system of harmonies stated his firm belief that the earth is an enormous living animal and enumerates even the analogies between its habits and those of known animated beings he considered the tides as waves produced by spouting out of water through its gills and he explains their relation to the solar and lunar motions by supposing that the terrene monster was like other animals its daily and nightly alterations of sleeping and waking from the consideration of kepler's astrological opinions it is an agreeable transition to proceed to the examination of his high merits as an astronomer and a philosopher as an experimental philosopher or an astronomical observer kepler does not lay claim to our admiration he himself acknowledges that for observations his sight was dull and for mechanical operations his hand was awkward he suffered much from weak eyes and the delicacy of his constitution did not permit to expose himself to the night air notwithstanding these hindrances however he added several observations to those of tycho which he made with two instruments that were presented to him by his friend hoffman the president of states of styria these instruments were an iron sextant two and a half feet in diameter and a brass azimuthal quadrant three and a half feet in diameter both of which were divided into single minutes of a degree they were seldom used and we must regard the circumstances which disqualified kepler for an observer 
as highly favourable to the development of those great powers which he directed with undivided energy to physical astronomy. Even if Kepler had never turned his attention to the heavens, his optical labours would have given him a high rank among the original inquirers of his age. But when we consider him also as the discoverer of three great laws, which bear his name, we must assign him a rank next to that of Newton. The history of science does not present us with any discoveries more truly original, or which required for their establishment a more powerful and vigorous mind. The speculations of his predecessors afforded him no assistance. From the cumulus machinery adopted by Copernicus, Kepler passed at one step to an elliptical orbit with the sun in one of its foci, and from that moment astronomy became a demonstrative science. The splendid discoveries of Newton sprung immediately from those of Kepler and completed the great chain of truths which constitute the laws of planetary system. The eccentricity and boldness of Kepler's powers form a striking contrast with the calm intellect and enduring patience of newton the bright spark which the genius of one elicited was fostered by the sagacity of the other into a steady and permanent flame kepler has fortunately left behind him a full account of the methods by which he arrived at his great discoveries what other philosophers have studiously concealed kepler has openly avowed and minutely detailed and we have no hesitation in considering these details as the most valuable present that was ever given to science and as deserving the careful study of all those who seek to emulate his immortal achievements it has been asserted that newton made his discoveries by following a different method but this is a mere assumption as newton has never favoured the world with any account of the erroneous speculations and the frequent failures which must have preceded his ultimate success had Kepler done the same by recording only the final steps of his inquiries, his method of investigation would have obtained the highest celebrity and would have been held up to the future ages as a pattern of their imitation. But such was the candor of his mind and such his inordinate truth that he not only recorded his wildest fancies but embraced even his greatest errors. If Newton had indulged us with the same insight into his physical inquiries, we might have witnessed the same process which were employed by Kepler modified only by the different characters and intensities of their imaginative powers. When Kepler directed his mind to the discovery of a general principle, he said distinctly before him, and never once lost sight of the explicit object of his search. His imagination, now, untrained, indulged itself in the creation and invention of various hypotheses. The most plausible, or perhaps the most fascinating, of these was then submitted to a rigorous scrutiny, and the moment it was found to be incompatible with the results of observation and experiment, it was willingly abandoned, and other hypotheses submitted to the same severe ordeal. By thus gradually excluding erroneous views and assumptions, Kepler not only made a decided approximation to the object of his pursuit, but in the trials to which his opinions were submitted, and in the observations or experiments which they called forth, he discovered new facts and arrived at new views, which directed his subsequent inquiries. By pursuing this method, he succeeded in his most difficult researches and discovered those beautiful and profound laws which have been admiration of succeeding ages. In tracing the route which he followed, it is easy for those who live under the light of modern science to say that his fancies were often wild and his labours often wasted. But in judging of Kepler's methods, we ought to place ourselves in his times and invest ourselves with the opinion and knowledge of his contemporaries. In the infancy of a science there is no speculation so absurd as not to merit examination. The most remote and fanciful explanation of facts have often been the true ones, and opinions which have in one century been objects of ridicule have in the next been admitted among the elements of our knowledge. The physical world teems with wonders, and the various forms of matter exhibit to us properties and relations far more extraordinary than the wildest fancy could have conceived. Human reason stands appalled before the magnificent display of the creative power, and they who have drunk deepest of its wisdom will be the least disposed to limit the excursions of physical speculation. The influence of the imagination as an instrument of research has, we think, been much overlooked by those who have ventured to give laws to philosophy. This faculty is of the greatest value in physical inquiries. 
if we use it as a guide and confide in its indications it will infallibly deceive us but if we employ it as an auxiliary it will afford us the most invaluable aid its operation is like that of light troops which are sent out to ascertain the strength and position of an enemy when the struggle commences their service terminate and it is by the solid flanks of the judgment that the battle must be fought and won end of chapter 14 end of the martyrs of science by david brewster read by lambda